So for once, we are actually literally on the minute exactly. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the next installment of Wrist Chart Week. And I'm just waiting for the stream to catch up on the laptop. It normally takes about a week to do so. And there are so many of you here waiting. It's an absolute pleasure having you. Let's start with saying hi to a few of you. And I'll add a few disclaimers before we start the show. Curtis and Tim Mosso. If this is the real Tim Mosso, please shoot me an email. It'd be a pleasure to have you and to talk to you. Uh, Mark Bjorna, you said something great a second ago that I want to reach. Uh, Clive, Junior Johnson, Ben, Mark, Matthew, great. Eric Bell, we'll get to you in a second. Uh, Dan, there's a great comment made by Bjorna saying that, you know, checking the wine cooler, <laughs> making sure that everything's good before the show starts. That's literally me. You don't know what happens behind the scenes before the show starts, but it's a, it's a mess. Uh, now, one thing to begin, you can hear me. I think that's a good way to start. Comment one in the chat. That's a, that's a good way to start. Uh, and I just want to let you know that I am running a new microphone setup. It looks pretty decent. These levels, it's kind of the input level is currently at 9% and it's still spiking. So hopefully the audio is a little bit more decent than it would normally be. You can hear me. Great. Thank you, everyone. That's superb. And um, the trick is now I can't be too punchy with the things I say. I have to be very like subtle with the words because that just causes the mic to have all sorts of distortions. So the thinking is I'm going to be a little bit more mellow in the way that I present. You can now hear me a bit more directly. Hopefully this won't put you to sleep, but it's all we say. To all of you who are joining, an absolute pleasure having you. And everyone who submitted watches this week, it's great. We're going back to basics with this discussion. And dear artifacts in the chat, it's great. Oh, so many of you here. Um, ben, uh, ben saying that your mic sounds not so good as in the past. What happened was the last one that I had was very ambient. It was just a, a standard little headphone microphone. This is actually a, a full-on headset. It's got a more direct mic going into it. And it's got sound ending and everything, so it should be a bit more direct, at least. Hopefully, you can you can hear me okay. <laughs> have a glass of water. I have more than that, Jose. It's been a it's been a bit of a weird few days, I could say. The uh, the weather in the UK right now it's probably about thirty degrees in the room I'm sitting in right now. <laughs> uh, so we'll see if I pass out or if I, you know, if, if the sound suddenly goes dead, it might mean that I'm I'm off, uh, just because it is so bad in here, sweating bullets, but. Show must go on. And let's just, so Wrist Shot Week, for anyone who's new to the show, who's never been here before, it's basically a time when you, as an audience, submit your wrist shots in. I curate, I put them together. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see all the watches that are going to be on display. And the theme is daily wearing watches. And surprisingly, it turned out better than I thought. I didn't ask for the theme, but in a couple of emails, people, people were mentioning that they wear these watches virtually every day. And it's just so ideal because the watches really do speak that way. And uh, Mark's saying, I hope you have a great show. Thanks, Mark. It's an absolute pleasure having you here. And Dan, keep forgetting to submit a watch. Don't worry. There's always a second week. So we are going to have a great time. And Eric Bell, I want to start with addressing what happened. So Eric Bell, a man in Loch Lomond, it helps to know a Scotsman. That's all I can say. He sent in something amazing in the mail. It's a inch Murren from, uh, it's 12 years old. It's a beautiful single malt scotch. I have that here next to me. I've had about half of it already. In a, no, not, not the bottle, but half the glass that I'm using. And what an exceptional whiskey. It is stunning. Tiny island in Loch Lomond, in and around that area. And all I can say is it, it's bottled at 46%. So it's, it's a little bit rough. <laughs> it's for someone who's not used to it. I can tell you it's, it's quite strong. Half the bottle, Moby Life. That would be a, a laugh. What I can say is I actually had quite a hung hangover this morning, so I might not be on full four-hour stream, right, Clive? Maybe, possibly. Uh, this weather hasn't been good. When you when you drink copious amounts of wine the night before and try to sleep and then sweat the whole night, the next day is not the best, and today is that next day. So we'll see how, uh, how it all goes. Uh, I must say, gorgeous whiskey. What I can say is tasting it, uh, the... The one underlying note that I taste the most is peach. It's not peated. It's actually very subtle. And there's lots of tannin. You really taste the wood in it. And it's it's so nice having a proper whiskey on the channel for once. So by all means, if you'd like to send another whiskey into the show that I can test out, that would be a, a joy. Uh, and all of you in the chat, okay, okay. I'm going to, let's just talk about what I'm wearing, the typical Seamaster. This was taken on a walk this evening. 
It's been so hot in the south of England today, like literally 35 degrees. This is someone coming from South Africa. I can tell you that it is, oof, it's been, it's been mad, but you know what? Half past eight was pretty decent to walk out, but let's get straight to the watch that actually became the cover photo. Now I've critiqued the Black Bay 58 to death over the last few weeks, but the reason why this watch and this photo was used, I mean, it's quite self-explanatory, right? This belongs to Dear Artifact sent in, and this man deserves all the coverage that he should. Uh, he sent in so many watches over the last how about like six months we've been doing this show, and the photography is so professional. So what I've done is decided today is the day he gets his watch featured on the cover, and if you look at the uh, description of this video, show more, you click that button, you'll be able to actually follow him on, you'll be able to see his page on Instagram. And I highly recommend anyone who is on Instagram to have a look at his stuff because the photography is sublime. If I zoom right into the photo, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, the clarity, everything is just exceptional. And you know, these, these photos, it's great when you get to see atmosphere behind a photograph. I still, to this day, I've asked him a few times how he does it, but he, uh, he still hasn't given me the full description. I can imagine he has all kinds of lighting equipment and studio equipment in the room. So yeah, Tudor Black Bay 58. There was a great question, or, or should I say a statement made that I should be more critical on the watches that we look at. And that should be something that we should look into. Instead of just talking about the positives, I want to maybe focus in on the negatives a lot more with all the pieces we look at. So we get a bit more of a balanced look at everything. Amin Reviews, welcome. Your watches are gonna be up in a second. Uh, and Dan says that I saw a Seamaster 57 brand new for sale, Bristol Goldsmiths. They're still around. People are still uh, picking them up and they're still available for sure. Chi Town, does Cape Town get those dry Southern California summers? I tell you what, it is absolutely, how can I say, you know, the average temperature is like 30 degrees during, you know, three quarters of the year. So you get used to it. But even even now, uh, it takes it takes a bit of time. Uh, and Mena, all of you here, absolute pleasure having you. So let's get right to it. Uh, this week, what were the videos that came out this week? We looked at the uh, why you should save for a watch. This is actually a great example for a, for a piece to discuss this briefly. I'll put the, uh, the drop down in the corner if you'd like to see the video that came out this week. Why should you save for a watch? The premise was, was to just look at uh, what it means to save, not so much that it might be important for you and your savings, but in the sense that it lets you think a lot more about your decision before you make it. And this is a perfect example. Many people gravitate towards the 58 as their first watch. It's a great example for that. And all in all, I got some amazing comments. I had, I had university students, I had men in their 60s all commenting saying, this was a great piece of insight. It was nice to, to look at the subject a little bit differently. And I, I particularly like the university student who says, this has given me a bit more guidance in a different area. You know, don't take the word for gospel, but it's it's nice perspectives. That's all these discussions are ever about, really. You know. <laughs> so so Chaitan says, uh, saving starves off impulses. Absolutely, I agree. And if you'd like to get my attention, tag me in the chat at ID Guy. I'll be able to see it a lot easier. And yeah, and then re the Thursday I brought out a video talking about the explorers and it's been a busy week. It's amazing how these days just fall into one and you forget how much happens <laughs> over a period of time. Okay, so dear artifact, your submissions, Tudor Black Bear 58, it's just such a good photograph. You have a superb wrist as well. I've got to give you some wrist love. Must be at least like seven and a half or eight inches because these watches fit you extremely well. And for a lot of us, me included, like girly wrists, doesn't seem to work just as well. So uh, yeah, absolute pleasure featuring you. I hope everyone who is watching, if you can follow that link in the description, uh, the drop down, have a look at his Instagram page and check out the photos that he has. It's a very good eclectic taste as well. Focuses in on vintage inspired pieces. Uh, lots of the you know, very monochromatic watches, I would say is a good example. Um, yeah, anyway, thank you for this dear artifact. There are over a hundred, hundred of you watching and let me, get into the next pieces that are on show. And again, this theme of, of daily wearing watches speaks so true to the pieces that we will be seeing today because they're not, uh, should I say, there are gonna be some amazing ones that we're going to look at for sure. But there are also many that are, they sit, into, they sit in this excellent area of value versus price and everything in between. 
And this is one great example. This comes in from Amin, and he's in the chat. We saw him a second ago. And I gotta say, talking about a two-tone Aquaterra with a rubber strap, the colors are so complementary. Uh, this being the more modern variant with the date at the base of the dial. I must say, I really like the submissions. It feels like a going back to basics episode for once. So if this is your first time watching the show, you'll get a well-rounded understanding about what people love to wear, especially looking at the season we're in at the moment, you know, the transition from summer to winter, or should I say, uh, autumn. And everyone else in the chat here, dear Artifex says, cheers, it's a pleasure. Uh, do my 16 and a half wrists count as girly? No, shy town I'm about that area as well. I'm about 16, 75, 17, I don't know. Uh, it's great. And Mark P says, a little shout out to my wife, Hannah, who's kindly letting me watch this whilst we're on holiday. Mark, you're supposed to be enjoying your time up in Norfolk, right? Enjoying your time away from all of this. So I don't know what you're doing right now. And to all my fellow members in the UK at the moment, got to say, it's been, a, it's been a wild day here. Can't remember it being so hot here for a long time. Um, and dear Artifact, talking about your, your lighting and everything, you say just lateral light, studio, no studio gimmicks, camera on a tripod triggered by a remote. And then it's just about angling the watch so that it catches the right light. Uh, it's great. And all the photos have that same kind of theme around them, which is just even better, you know? Okay, so all of you here, Urun, Sun, great to have you, and the many others I see read in the chat. Uh, the the Burkhardt Spook, great to have you here. And yeah, let's carry on through. So Min sends in this beautiful piece. I must say, size and everything is great. That's the positives. The, the contrasting colors is one awesome thing. The way the, the batons and the hands all correspond with the... Uh, the rubber strap is another. Just simple things like the, the white. This is like a faux stitching on the on the strap itself. It all seems to work very well together as a piece. The one element that detracts from the, the watch, I would say, the one gripe I would have is the, the asymmetry, or should I say symmetry. It's too symmetrical. And you might find times when you get a bit lost in the dial because everything is the right, everything's the same size, everything's balanced. Um, not to say that it's not great, but it might take a little bit longer for you to read the time compared to other watches just because of how clean everything looks. There's this, there's this whole idea of where do, you, where do you draw the line between clear, you know, clean and cluttered? And this, this seems to ride it pretty well. I mean, we get right in and we have a look at the, the slats, the horizontal slats along the dial. It's a great looking watch. There was mention uh, from, from Rohit saying, love the contrast. It is something. I, I've, I've never seen a black layout is this black or is this silver i don't even know if it's the light that he's catching but the aquaterra line as it is when we talk about an entry-level watch a daily driver does does the job and being a master chronometer i think these are meta certified as well so they have all the trimmings that you would want has a display case back i mean omega does some amazing stuff and there's going to be lots of them we'll see them during the show okay got to carry on through next from Amin, he sends in a 1974 boulevard jump hour I mean, talk about differences. Amin, we know as as the lad who sent in a Moser Pioneer, or was it Endeavor? I never get it right, but a stunning Moser. And the collection, as we are seeing, just continues to expand. I think he said this is his birth year. He was born in 74. And talking about a jump hour, I love that it's German branded. There's so many little quirks. We will see a few peculiar watches on the show, but nothing too crazy. It's actually so grounded, the things that we're going to see uh, in total. Love the layout, though, the contrast, everything separated. The rule of thirds, I don't know if, if you know this in the audience, but it's all to do with just how objects are placed in a, in a setting. And we see that this arrangement of this dial is set in such a way that it takes up at the moment, it's sitting at right about half the halfway line. But the way the date then contrasts against it, you see that there's this, this asymmetry that seems to work. It's, there's all sorts of stuff. I mean, talking about design. Again, the show has been going for 14 minutes, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not awake just yet. Uh, but as it is, great looking piece. I think this is the only jump hour that we're going to be seeing. But yeah, the, the variety on show, it's going to be a lot of fun. So thank you for these, Amin. Keep sending them in. Love seeing the watches that you have. Next up, we have Angelo, and he sends in a Smith's Everest, which he says it's purely because of me. And uh, what did he say? I've just written this in the corner. Uh, I'm fully responsible. That was my, my one-liner. And it's a watch that I wear all the time. I never stop wearing this piece. Whenever I'm going out somewhere, especially doing something like cooking on the fire outside or going for a run or whatever, it's a practical watch to just throw on. 
I must say, I'd love to have a 1016 one day, but hell, this ticks all the boxes for that feeling, the wearability. Plus, you get a, a sapphire crystal, you get all the trimmings of a modern watch. Uh, I can't say enough about it. Not that I'm spruiking the brand, because I've never been paid by Eddie, the owner at Time Factors, to do any of these promotions. He has sent me the watches to review. And I honestly, truthfully, wear these watches all the time. I currently have three Smith's pieces in my collection. So I'm definitely not just spruiking the brand. I, I'm definitely one who is behind what these pieces are and such a lot of fun to own and wear. Refreshing the stream because it looks like my laptop is taking a bit of time to catch up with everything going on. And to all of you in the chat who are joining us, welcome. It's a pleasure having you here. Those of us in the UK, I hope you're surviving. <laughs> I don't know everywhere else. I know in Europe, you were having a hard time as well. Like in Paris, it was 40 degrees or something daft. Okay, uh, Zeitwerk, I don't think we have one of those. No, we do have a longer one though, a really special one. Going to carry on. So thank you for this, Angelo. Next, we're jumping to Ant, and we have a little bit of a mini collection review. I think I saw Ant in the, in the chats a second ago. But this is... What I find interesting is we've we've had a look at his collection over the last, I would say, three, four months. And his collection has changed quite a bit. And he's reduced down the watches that he had in his set. So currently, he's sitting on five pieces. And what a collection of pieces. Let's just go through them. This is a 5513 that I think is from 1983, roughly. Uh, gorgeous El Primero, as mentioned by Ryan in the chat. It's just, it's just the business. I think it's about 39 and a half mils. Great contemporary size. His latest pickup, a 15300 uh, automatic, you get to see the running seconds. So it's, I was told it's the same size as the Jumbo, being right around that 38 and a half mils. It's a fantastic size. There's a reason why Genta wanted it that size. There's a perfect amount of presence because Genta watches generally wear, all these integrated bracelet pieces, they generally wear two millimeters larger than they, they would appear. And then across from that, we have a Patek 5227 Calatrava with an officer's case back, stunning, and then a root beer GMT. So, I mean, as a combination of watches, he has vintage, he has a modern, we could say diver-ish GMT variant, as well as you know, a classic, beautiful El Primero, AP Royal Oak as the centerpiece, and a Calatrava. Now, the watch that he had to sell to make space for, all of, for, for the AP, if I'm not wrong, was the, the Lunga Saxonia Thin. And I really like that watch. If it was me and I had the choice to, to choose, like you know, getting rid of which one and keeping which, I would have probably sold the Patek and kept the Lunga. That's just me. I'm, I'm definitely someone who's more in love with Lunga's uh, methods. But in saying that, you're dealing with a watch here that has an officer's case back. There's a lot more detail to this piece. So I can understand why he kept it. But mentioning uh, in the chat, Ed saying all the bases covered, absolutely. You've got a modern really cool modern watch i mean talk about the rose gold this i've spoken about so many times the rose gold and the root beer styling it just blends so nicely in with a skin tone uh balanced as as ricardo says gorgeous calatrava this is one i would say one of the best they've made over time you've got a date all the hallmarks that you want to see from a calatrava as well as officer's case back then you've got a royal oak that has a display case back automatic movement the full everything's on display blue dial this being a modern take, I don't know the age of this watch, if this is current at the point in time. Uh, and then you've got an El Primero, which just covers your chronograph perfectly. If you want an automatic chronograph, nothing really beats the El Primero when you talk about its history and the subdials and everything else. And then a, a gorgeous vintage Submariner. I think this is his birth year sub as well. So it's just, it's so simple. Uh, when we talk about the area of everyday wearing or daily wearing watches, you could wear any of these and not feel like you're needing something else, right? I think it's a great looking set, all in all, all together. Clean, simple, basic. And we're going to carry on through next to uh, Ricky. Thank you for this, Ant. It's always good seeing a small collection. And we're going straight to a Speedmaster Hesselite. I get a super chat from Wrath of the Cardinal saying, Megan is wrecking havoc in the watch community. You introduced this person. The least you could do is prove she's a real person, not a catfish. She is most definitely a real person. I've spoken to her personally for a long, long time. And I definitely don't want to talk about what's been going on, discussing the, the discord and all of that. Uh, it's not my place to get involved. But what I can say is that people just need to appreciate what other people have. It's a good way to start. 
Uh, there's no need for bickering. This, this community, what we're doing at the moment, just appreciating what everyone has, this is not supposedly a, a place to show off wealth, status, ego, everything in between. I like this to be a time when we can mellow out and enjoy a Saturday or whenever and just see what everyone likes to own. Uh, the Discord, I, I was a part of it briefly and yeah, I got very, very busy. Didn't appreciate it, I must say. It really turned nasty. It's just, it is, there's no reason for it. There really is no reason for bullying. And, uh, you know, what else can I say? It's not my place to really intervene or make a statement about it. But uh, Megan is most definitely a real person. And yeah, people have been uh, going at it over the last few days. Everyone's taking a break, which I think is valid. Everyone deserves a break. Uh, watches aren't life. There's so much more to these things. Again, we, we focus ourselves around the materialistic acquisition of things all the time. And uh, there's so much more to this world than measuring yourself against someone else. It's just not necessary, really. So yeah, thank you so much for the super chat. And yeah, I've got to carry on through. True manners, true gent. No, Neo. I mean, I'm just trying to speak from the heart. I can't do it live. If I had a bit more time to think and present, it'd probably be a lot clearer. But yeah, everything else that's going on. Yeah. Anyway, so talking about the Hesselite, it's a gorgeous watch. It's one of those entry, again, a piece similar to the Black Bay 58 that gets someone into the hobby. And what it is, for what it is, it's excellent. Simple, basic. Hesselite crystal allows you to appreciate all the scratches and intricacies, aluminum bezel. You get to enjoy a cam wheel chronograph, I guess, but uh, all in all, when it comes to being a sports watch that you can wear on a daily basis, this one, this one does a good job, really does. Uh, yeah, so for all of you again who are joining, thank you. Thank you everyone who've sent in watches for the show. It's such a nice curated collection of pieces that really ground us into what everyone else has. So Ricky, thank you for sending this in. And uh, he did, oh, geez, this is what I wanted to mention. I put this in brackets. This is a Grail watch of his. This is a Grail watch. It's a 40th anniversary that I think he got, a wedding anniversary. And the clasp is engraved, I think, with, with the details of his anniversary. But Ricky has been looking forward to owning this for a long, long time. And again, talking about saving for the watch and really thinking about what you want to get. I mean, can you say that this is not just an excellent substitute for that? It's fantastic. I mean, this hobby, I've tried my best to like capture all the little details and stories behind the watches that come in. So this was good. I wanted to focus on this. Ricky, thank you for sending the shot in. Really get to appreciate all the little highlights and details. Next up, jumping to Blaine. And this is cool. I don't know what they call this in the community. I do know it's the Whirlpool. The reference is an SB, uh, SBGR311, but it's got a brown dial. And a brown whirlpool, I don't know how best you would want to describe that in the collector community, but I'll leave it up to you. <laughs> uh, stunning watch, though. I mean, we've had a look at the, the blue dial version of this. Never seen the brown dial. And you get to really appreciate, again, the way they do their printing and the layout and the texture everywhere. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, Neil, great to have you. And everyone else who's joining, once again, what a dial. Demetrius, great to have you here, sir. All of these little, I mean, I don't know why they go so far to the length to, to get all of this detail in, but I would imagine it has to do with something with uh, counterfeiting, maybe. There's no way you could accurately counterfeit a dial that's been finished like this. The brown whirlpool, oh dear. My thoughts, Matthew, I don't know what this is called in the collector space, but uh, uh, look at the way they do the script here. How it gets smaller, I don't know how they machine this, what kind of lathe they use to get this effect going, but it is, it's Grand Seiko how they do it, how they approach. And here's a more natural shot in the light. I think he's pulled out the crown just so we get a good look. And as far as a daily wearing watch goes, what Brown manages to do so well is just sit comfortably. It works with any kind of clothing you're wearing, any form of colors. Uh, as far as a piece to wear on a daily basis, this is a good example. Actually, a watch that represents Grand Seiko so well too, because you very seldom see Brown dial watches. Uh, there are very few of them. How often do you see a Grand Seiko that has a brown dial on top of it? Is it copper or brown? Rohit asks. I have absolutely no idea. Uh, I mean, you zoom in and you get to see these, these effects that happen here, and it looks coppery. You could almost say, I don't know, what would you say? Like aged bronze almost. Yeah, it looks so good. It really does look nice. And so far, the pace is good. 24 minutes into the show, and we are, we are motoring. 
and I haven't had to drink any of the whiskey or all the rest. Uh, Flippin saying made with a spiro spirograph. Is that even a thing? Is that even a thing? It looks it looks unreal. I mean, this just reminds you of something from a, a different time period. It feels almost like it's from the Aztec era. You know what I mean? Uh, and carrying on through, Blaine, thank you for sending this in. What a stunning watch. Never seen a brown dial variant of this before. Jumping to Bob next. Bob has been struggling to send me an email with the selection of pieces that he has. Uh, he lives on a yacht in Florida. And this is the modern variant of the Seamaster 300. Producer Michael asking, did the family pay to promote their watches? No, I didn't. Uh, they haven't ever paid me a cent. I've never actually had one of their watches into review. So, uh, <laughs> no. I <laughs> uh, love the comments. I, I got to keep rolling through, though. I, I don't know how attentive I'll be with the comments this evening, but I will try my utmost to uh, catch all of you guys. Again, running a tight ship, trying to keep the show rolling. It was It was so interesting having a guest on because... I really want last week, I really wanted my guest to uh, talk a lot more and for me to listen for a change, which was great. It was so nice. Uh, now getting back into this, I need to learn to get my voice back in action and you know cool it down. Again, it's like 30 degrees in the room right now. So if I do pass out or die, uh, that's the reason. Um, okay. So Bob, it's a stunning watch. I mean, all the little details, what Omega did so well here was, you know, take the aesthetics of the classic and modernize it in many ways. The sandwich dial, the the loom, the faded loom is not as orange as you would expect. Ceramic bezel, again, this falls right into that category of a watch that's perfect for a daily wearer, as uh, as I do, wearing mine piece. And then to Bob again, this is such a great shot, sitting amongst the ropes. You get to see how the dial works in this light too. And it's almost like a coffee brown. It's not exactly black. Uh, and there's texture and gradient to it as well. Um, so going to carry on through. Uh, the super chat from Juan. Thank you, as always, Juan. I really hope you enjoy the pieces that are going to be shown from your set. Uh, gorgeous, gorgeous reverso. And yeah, more questions about my thoughts of bullying. What do I con constitute bullying? I don't know. Personal attacks. Uh, I don't know where to start. I don't, definitely don't want this to be a show about this for sure. So yeah, by all means, uh, chat away. Going to carry on with the rest of the pieces. And uh, Vava, Vava Zella says I should be at 100 subs. What did you do to offend YouTube? YouTube is becoming corrupt. Um, you know, all I can say is I am who I am. Say whatever. Say what I want to say. That's The platform has always been a place where I just like to voice opinions and thoughts. It's never been anything too direct on anyone in particular. I don't want this to be a place of nastiness. It's just no point, uh, especially on a Saturday evening. I mean, you have there's so many better things you could be doing than watch this. So, I mean, if you're not interested, there's the door. <laughs> uh, Bob, thank you for sending this in. I love, got to say, I love the presentation, love the rope and the, the texture. And just as, as far as the everyday wearer, again, this ticks all the boxes. You live on a yacht. You use this all the time. You can see there's scratches all over the bracelet. So, I mean, it's it's an excellent everyday piece. And uh, yeah, man, enjoy it. That's all you can say. It's a great looking watch. There definitely are areas for improvement on it. I don't know so much about the, the movement itself. I don't know how well uh, uh, regulated it is next to the other variants. Of course, the, the gripes many people have is the polished surface next to the bezel, which is a bit of an issue. I can definitely attest to that. And other details like the bracelet, the polished in the center as opposed to polish on the sides of the bracelet. All sorts of little details that could be uh, improved. I think the watch would definitely suit a full brush. Definitely when I do a review of, of mine in a year's time or whenever. Uh, definitely want to focus in on some of those highlights and details. Yeah, carrying on. Bob, thank you for sending this. Jumping next to another Aquaterra coming in from Bryso. And again, the similar format. We've got a rubber strap. We've got a blue dial, blue highlights and accents. I'm going to take a hit from the water and carry on through. Yeah, so the rest of the comments coming in. Uh, let's, I, I can't, I can't, really can't deal with this. Uh, it's getting quite irritating. And Mark saying leave. Yeah, I mean, really, you guys don't have to. You don't have to do this at a time when we can just all sit back and enjoy ourselves. There's no need to discuss other issues. I don't want this to be a place of debate. 
Definitely not. Uh, so as far as Aquaterras go, this being, I don't know if this is a modern watch or if this uh, uh, one of the latest releases or not. I think generally it has to do with the date at the six o'clock next to it being on the, uh, the 15, at the 15 mark, at the three o'clock position. But as far as colors go, this this aquamarine blue looks very similar to the blue that we see on the uh, the Nautilus pieces, right? Uh, light blue highlights, those details. It's a stunning looking watch. It really is great. As an everyday wearer, again, takes all those boxes. And he sent in a few more. He sent in his Batman on a Jubilee, which is probably one of the most sought after watches in the space at this point in time. Uh, I think overall what it does so well this is not the best shot to see the the full bezel layout and everything oops but what it does so well is present itself as a piece that rides the line between being something more elegant something more formal as well as sporty and then talking about how the colors work so well together everything it just makes it such an appealing piece overall uh, the, the character that it has, as far as the use of color on this watch in particular, it's become a piece in the Rolex line that I think is one of the best, purely because of how it represents the complication, being a GMT, day and night sky, black and blue. Okay, going to carry on. This is another shot from Bryso, sending in his very well-worn Explorer 2. That's a 16570, I think, if I'm not wrong. And this photo, he says, it's not me doing the mountain climbing. It's, it's just a stock photo from Rolex. But he seems to wear this watch a lot. And I think this is the only, I think this is the only Explorer 2 we have on the show uh, in, this, in this gen. It's got a, it doesn't have a holes case, so it must mean it's slightly more modern. It's got a solid end link. But over, oops, Magic Mouse. Magic Mouse is not helping me here. We have a lot of pieces to look through, and the room is getting so hot. There's talk about AC and everything else. It is unreal today being the hottest day of the year, well, they say, technically. Um, overall, the polar is great, Bjorn says. I think it is. I think it really is. Um, overall, great looking watch. And as a collection, he's got a few. So the pieces that he sent in, Aquaterra, Batman Jubilee, uh, Explorer 2, and then a gorgeous, I think the only, no, there's another Reverso. This being such a gem, the blue layout on the Reverso is something stunning, really is appealing. And overall, I mean, when you're talking about a watch to celebrate a color falling under a theme, we've already had a look at that Grand Seiko with the brown dial. You look at the Reverso and think, wouldn't it be nice to get this format or the burgundy format? It looks stunning. And then you look at another brand. We're going to have a look at a date just in a second. And that color just screams again. You've got to ask yourself, is it something important for you to match the color of your watch with the brand? Possibly, maybe. And saying reversos are gorgeous. They really are. They are stunning. But there's so many variants too. I mean, the black dial is something cool. Uh, the, the burgundy is one of the most special, I think. Well, that, that wine color looks great. Everything looks superb and being readily brushed you can really appreciate the way the light hits it directly uh, it's great i really love this set bryso thank you for sending them all in and now we're going to jump to something a bit more old school this coming in from cedar canoe who is often in the chat he's often here he always sends in watches and this is a freshly serviced yema i hope it's saying i hope it's saying yema not yema which is is it yema I'm going to say Yemma. Yemma Yachtingraf, 69, with a Velju 7733, just come back from a full service. And of course, the way you can tell this is a yachting or regatta timer is the uh, the subdial with the orange, sorry, the, the blue and, and red highlights. That looks so good. Inca block, patent pending. And when you talk about a classic, this presents pretty well in that area. Taking a hit from the water, 121 click bezel says just here. And check out the watches. There's some good stuff. I think you're really going to appreciate it. There's some Air Kings. There's there's all sorts on display. Your Air King, I think, is the only one, actually. Uh, but as far as layout goes, I think the one element that really pulls me to it is this, this layout here. This hand, I don't know which is the counterbalance and which is the actual pointing end. Uh, the idea here, really, when you're running the regatta timer, you want to be sure to track five-second intervals for when you, you take off at the starting grid. And overall, what this piece does is really captivate that error. I think the time period of being a 69 
you get to see it all, right? You get to see all the little details. The way the bezel has been done, this is actually a rotating bezel. So that's something else too. Um, everything. If we look at the numerals, you can see how it represents that transition to the, the 70s styling where, excuse me, uh, you're dealing with, with indices that are raised, that are applied, that have these polished and brushed ends. Oh, that's just good. This watch has definitely seen some life, probably seen a bit of water ingress in its time. Who knows? But but overall, I think it looks stunning, superb. So thank you for sending this in, Cedar Canoe. Absolute pleasure. Now we're jumping to Chi Town. And this was so close to being the cover photo because the presentation is there. We've never featured a SKX009 on the cover. And I love this. He was sitting, he was standing on the San Diego Pier, overhead casting. Uh, jumping, no jumping or diving. And I think if I managed to get the diving involved with, uh, you know, the, the cover photo itself, it would have looked so good. And yeah, what can we say about the 009? It's a watch that has most definitely received quite the cult status nowadays. And just everything about it. When we look at who wears it and who picks these up? Again, daily wearing watches. This fits the bill perfectly. Funny, uh, next week we're looking at watches cast in film. I sat back and thought a little bit more about how we could look at it differently. And I think you're going to enjoy how it was approached. And of course, we know this watch became quite popular on the wrist of uh, Robert Redford in All Is Lost. I think the film came out in about 2014 and he's wearing it on a NATO strap. And it's there's some interesting ties to what you could consider him as a watch wearer in the film. He maybe wore a, a Willard, a 6105 back in Vietnam considering his age and everything. Uh, overall, it's a great piece on the Jubilee bracelet. I mean, you can't go wrong, right? Uh, and I definitely want to do more talks around this watch in particular. I think most of the time people are drawn to the, the SKX 007, maybe the, the 014, but never the, the 009 as much. And what I love so much about this comparison, and I, this was done deliberately, we are going to have a look at a great piece sent in by Curtis, who was in the chat earlier on. Uh, and yeah, I think you're going to enjoy this. So, Shaitan, this is a gorgeous photo, by the way. If you want a perfect template for a cover photo for the show, this is it. This was going to be the cover. I was so close. The reason why you didn't win, Shaitan, was just because I wanted Dear Artifact to get the, the publication for a change, to have his, his Instagram looked at because his photos are sublime. But if you send this in again next week, I will make this the cover. It just it just does the work. Uh, have a bit of sleeve so I can put all the details here. And as far as presenting the watch and all the details you want to see, brushed case, the bracelets, the dial, mm, stunning. Thank you for that, Shaitan. Absolute pleasure. But next up, speaking about uh, Pepsi bezels, we jump to our man, Curtis. Curtis, the pilot, the qualified industrial designer, uh, Marine who decided then to become a commercial pilot. And this is a 1983 6.16750 that he has been wearing throughout his career as a pilot. And what's special is that he retires on the 16th of August. He's currently, I think he's in the beginning of the chat, he said that he is uh, just traveling out to Australia quite suddenly. And he believed that his last flight was in Hong Kong or to Hong Kong. And overall, what can you say about this watch? I really thought it was a 1675 at first when we featured it on the show. And Mr. Paracord, Matthew, that's great. He loves wearing straps and, and things on his wrist as well as the watch. It's great. I mean, it's, it's superb. And he has great taste. Uh, we chat a lot. We email a lot of times. And uh, his, he is so looking forward to picking up a gondola, if he can. We, we, there was a talk about salmon dial watches a couple of weeks back. And we had a great time just discussing what they mean because he's also because he's from that industrial design background he, he understands the, the warmness and what it might mean to someone who collects them and yeah i mean this this piece really is if i zoom right in that dial is superb i think he's had it serviced once but this was his daily wearer for well over 20 years when he was flying and all it i mean it's just gorgeous it is absolutely sublime but then next up so what he did was in celebration of i think his his 50th, I can't remember the, his, his age, uh, but he bought himself a Skydweller on top of it. Now, for a commercial pilot to wear a Skydweller, that is something, right? You don't, you don't really think about or hear about the Skydweller as a watch worn by pilots often. And 
I was very interested in knowing whether or not he there, there was validity to it. There's always talk about the sky dweller being the modern traveler's watch and all of that. But you think the GMT is optimal for what it is because it's legible, easy to read. The sky dweller, on the other hand, is a piece that represents how Rolex has taken its, you know, the classic aesthetics, all of those details that they loved in their date justs, in their day dates in the 50s, but also transplanted a GMT complication on top of it. And I think as far as layout goes, you have this, this gorgeous sunburst black dial, uh, two-tone, I think it's yellow gold, two-tone layout. And he wears this all the time as he's flying. And I think it's great. This is his, his information before taking off. I think this was his supposed last trip before retiring next week. But uh, yeah, as far as the transition from old to new, again, I'll say that he's worn this watch on his wrist for well over 20 years flying commercially and then decided to opt to pick up a Sky Dweller as that transition away. And yeah, I love it. Talk about having a commercial pilot and using this watch all the time when he travels. I think it looks stunning. So Curtis, thank you for sending these in. It's always a treat. And I'm missing you all in the chat. Uh, not for me, Mark says. It's definitely polarizing. I think uh, talking about the scale and the size of it, they improved on this generation next to the first because the first had like a white subdial inside here and it was a mess. It was very cluttered. What they've done so well here is <laughs> managed to match the colors. My thinking is whether or not the, the watch would be suited better without all the text on the dial. And if they just had one separate window at the top instead, but then it might look a bit too basic. I think they, they consciously thought having it exposed would give it a bit more visual flair. Don't know, it's all up to you. Anyway, carrying on through Curtis, thank you for sending these in. Next, we go to Darren who sends in 214270. He just picked this watch up from the AD last month and it's it's stunning. Uh, <laughs> and shout out saying, will I be needing bulletproof coffee soon? Well, I have like, I have like half a, a mug left. It's okay. It's it's a uh, Nescafe. It's not the best. And the whiskey, I need to take another hit from again. But I just need to stay hydrated more than anything else. It is, it's stifling in this room right now. That's not the real Tim Mosso. I think we all agree that's not the, the real Tim Mosso. <laughs> Would be good, though. Be nice to chat to him. Uh, so, Darren, thank you for sending this in. It's always a pleasure. This being a Mark II, of course. I'd love to get my hands on one. Uh, we don't know whenever that'll happen. Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, carrying on through, Darren, thanks for sending this in. We are going to see a lot of explorers later on in the show. And Dino is saying that Rolex, most interesting watch after the Daytona, being a Rolex fanboy. Uh, thank you for that. So talking about the Sky Dweller. You see, our tastes are so different in this area. My personal taste about this watch, uh, it's too busy for me. I think it is too busy. What I can appreciate about it is it's a watch that does ride the line between those classic inspirations and just where the brand is now as a, as a modern house. It does an excellent job in that area. And I feel that the same thing to the Explorer. I want to touch on that in more detail because for me, I think the the layout of this dial, the, the numerals, I definitely didn't, uh, I didn't like it at first. I thought it was too modern for what it is. <laughs> Let's make the Explorer happen for me, Neo, thank you. Uh, but speaking about where Rolex is now, actually, I'll just put a link in the corner. I uh, did a video all about the Explorer on Thursday. And then they talk about the, the watch's development fully. Where it is at the moment, it manages to show everyone just how Rolex as a brand is looking at the Explorer and interpreting it. Whether or not they'll bring the size down ever so slightly is open to interpretation. No one knows. Uh, Matthew saying, my older eyes would have trouble reading the Sky Dweller. Yeah, it's too cluttered. For a lot of people, I think it's, it's very busy. And then in saying that, talking about it being a pilot's watch, you think, is it not too much for you know easy quick reading when you're wanting to determine the time in a different zone and and all the rest uh so yeah it's great great area for debate maybe we could do a versus talking about the, the gmt next to the the sky dweller darren thank you for sending this in next up we have demetrius now demetrius sent in his and he's in the chat he was here a second ago uh a date just 41 with a mosaic. And let me try and get this right. My, my Greek, I love Greek mythology, but I, I'm definitely not the best at uh, enunciating. Zephyrus, Zephyrus, to try and say, the personification of the west wind in Greek mythology. So this being a mosaic, we know that it was one of the most famous movements in the Greco-Roman time period. 
And that's just stunning. I mean, Demetrius is a true uh, red-blooded Greek. And it's it's nice seeing, talking about his collection, he has some great pieces he's sent in in the past. Flip and Zippo, thank you for the super chat. Really do, thank you. And uh, yeah, towards the Explorer as well. <laughs> thank you, Flip and Zippo. It's going to take a long time. I think well over a year before that even is remotely possible. But it's something to aspire to own, I think. Sitting in the Rolex and the Omega seat, would be, I mean, that's me. Can't say I need much more for a collection, right? Okay, so Demetrius also sends in, next to the 41, he also sends in a max bill. And I mean, for many people, again, talking about daily wearing watches, this is something that gets people right into the hobby. And I'm going to botch these names completely. It looks like it's it's Thetis, Thetis and Achilles as the statue that it's resting on. Uh, but everything about this watch, we talk about mesh bracelets. Demetrius loves putting mesh bracelets on these pieces and on all of his pieces, actually, Seamasters and everything else. The Max Bill, I mean, everything it does, what I find funny is you know, we, we really appreciate good design. Industrial designers generally try and focus in on areas of good design. This being designed with great intention to make it clear, you know, clear simple. It's just so German in the way it's done. Everything from the typeface, from the, the dial arrangement, the layout. The one area that seems to attract a lot of people to this watch is the four on the dial, which is very interesting because it's something that you may not notice at first, but everything about it is so crystal clear and simple. And this, what's funny is this, this design, this style doesn't appeal to me much, but being someone who loves industrial design, it should be something that does the trick, right? Uh, but I actually spoke about it with Cam last week during the live show saying that uh, we're actually going to look at an Icopod in a second made by Mark Newson. Designers tend to try and put their, their hands into every pie, where I think you know, they're, they're qualified watch creators who've been doing it for decades. They probably know a lot more than the, the standard designer does. Anyway, Bauhaus, Bauhaus is boring for you. And that's interesting from, from Uren Sun. It is, uh, it's definitely a style that is not for everyone, uh, but it is so reminiscent of that late 30s, or should I say early 30s to, to late 30s, early 40s transition before uh, the Nazi occupation and all the rest. Okay, going to carry on through. Thank you, Demetrius. And next we have Dylan. We also know as 121 click bezel, if he's in the chat. And this is a newly picked up Air King that he's enjoying the hell out of. And it's the most uh, one of the most polarizing and divisive watches in their modern line, I think. Uh, when we talk about what it is, you know, it's got a Milgauss case, it's got Mark I Explorer numerals on the dial, uh, and the dial arrangement with the, the Sands zero at the, at the five position, and, and all sorts of little details. Uh, it's it's so peculiar. There he is in the chat. Great to have you. And the color scheme is also what I love so much about this piece. That's probably better to look at really enjoy the green and yellow points and the accents on the dial. It would be so nice if Rolex did more of that with their development because it, it represents the brand so well. And the Air King, funny, talking about Air Kings, in a second, we're going to see an original Air King from like 1946. And that, what a beautiful watch. So we'll talk about the history of the Air King at that point. And you did send in a few more, I think. Uh, Air King presentation, I said here. Let me just, there's some good chats going on. Let me try and reach them. James, thank you so much for the super chat. And having you here on the show, absolute pleasure having you. Um, I hope you're enjoying it. hope you enjoy it. Just kick back and, and listen to this. Rolex's Flieger 121 says, yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, it is. It's, it's A style, right? It's an A, an A type Flieger dial. And Junior Johnson, my time and effort, no. This is, this is fun. This really is fun. These shows, these shows are not because of me. Got to emphasize that. It's because of you that you send these pieces in that these shows are possible. And it's, again, I love the fact that we can all sit back and enjoy what we as enthusiasts, as individuals like to own. They don't need to be $500,000 or pounds. They can be 500 bucks. They can be 100 bucks. Whatever floats your boat, whatever aesthetic speaks to you, whatever brand does it, we get a much better understanding of what people like and not so much what is advertised to us all the time. Sure, there are a few that we do see often. Uh, I mean, I'm someone who's buying into an Explorer, hopefully one day, and that's such a common watch nowadays. But talking about the Air King, it's great to see that you have this watch because there's talk about this piece going up in value one day. It's such an outlier in the family. It just doesn't seem to be a piece that screams what the modern brand does. It's almost like they, they just threw it all together. 
whatever they could, wherever they could. And uh, as far as layout goes, it's simple, it's clear. Well, not really. I'd say it's quite cluttered overall. But it is also something that, that definitely catches your attention. It harks back to what the original Air Kings were about, which we will look at in, in a little while. But he also sent in a few more shots. Let's first check out the Seamaster that he sends in. This is one of his most recent acquisitions as well. Seamaster Professional 300 with the most peculiar dial arrangement in the family. Showcase, good having you here talking about the Air King. Uh, it's a Rolex sleeper. Really do think it's gonna probably catch on and people are interested. I love that that Watchfinder video of the inverted uh, six or the, what they had like, like six, three nines on the dial or something daft. Love that. So the Seamaster, I love the photography here. We get to see all the little accents and the finishing. This being one of the most peculiar, oh no, Eric Bell, we just jumped to you, sorry bud. This being one of the most peculiar dials that the family makes and the most polarizing for sure. I mean, I don't wanna crit criticize your watch too much, uh, Dylan, but I have to say that when I saw this piece released next to the blue dial, which is the, the, the icon, next to the black dial, which is just so versatile, and the great white, which I think we will see later actually, white dial layout. Um, this piece feels unfinished to me personally it's it reminds me of a watch that or a dial that they just said hey this looks pretty good without the finishing let's just seal it up and send it uh, and that's just you know my take on the piece all in all definitely not uh, the most educated of one liners around it but the silver dial mixed with the blue i mean if you love it that's all that matters at the end of the day right and then jumping to the collection that you have Again, being in the Rolex and the Omega chair, it feels pretty good. And you notice that he's chosen two of the outliers in the set, which I think is also something interesting to pay attention to. Uh, 121 says that the loom on the Omega helps make a great layout. Talking about the loom plots, oh, absolutely. Uh, I think the way they've, they've tackled the modern variant, the size is a bit of an issue, but the, the way they've you know, put the date at the six o'clock position, everything's balanced. There are a few elements that really, it's polarizing. I think when we get to the great white later on, I'll sit down and enjoy the uh, the talk around the modern uh, reign of this watch and what they have done that's a little bit head scratching, I think, next to the Rolex. When you see them side by side, I think the Rolex looks like a watch that's much more contemporary in this space, this modern space, you know? The, the Omega, on the other hand, it looks space age. It looks, looks bizarre, so peculiar. And then across from it, we have an IWC chronograph and a Longines heritage. I don't know the names of these. You're gonna have to help me. Uh, and there's a question from Marvel saying 58 or Pelagos. Oof, good question. We're gonna see a Pelagos at a later stage. Uh, my money, I would go for Pelagos. It depends if it can fit your wrist okay. But the the Pelagos is the true unsung hero of the brand. It's all modern. It's titanium. It's got all the bells and whistles, a, f a fancy clasp, and all sorts of little details. Helium release valve. Where do you stop? Snowflake hands. It's absolutely sublime. It's a terrific looking watch. So that's the one I would recommend uh, personally. But if you have a smaller than average wrist, then possibly towards the 58. Again, it's down to wearing experience and what you do on a daily basis. Um, yeah, this as far as the collection goes, it's so peculiar. Must say, you have some interesting tastes, uh, Dylan. Uh, IWC Retropunt double chronograph. Oh, really? Wow, that's nice. Eh? That's really nice. And IWC as a brand, they've they've gone all over the show lately. Got to say, I love the applied numerals on the dial. Looks sublime. Oh, I'm sweating in this room. I cannot begin to tell you. It's nuts. I got to take a hit of water. Blue shirt, good to have you. Uh, Junior Lee, I'm doing great videos. Oh, thank you, man, really. Uh, don't, I definitely don't need praise. This has never been a place for ego. <laughs> I'm, see, again, I don't want to be someone that, that you know, presents in such a way that there's you know, drive behind what I say. I just put a thought out and hope that someone interprets it in a certain way, whether they take it as a positive or a negative. That's what makes this hobby fun. We all have opinions. It's not just like, I'm the sole contributor. So I think it's important that we all share our thoughts around whatever pieces we see and are given. Yeah, so, so Michael says, wrist shots, I'm in. Trust me, they're, they're everywhere. And I think I might have saved yours. I think I remember your name in the emails. Again, I get like 100 emails over the course of a week. So saving them, I, I don't necessarily thank you. I just save them and, and curate them for the show. Dylan, thank you for sending these in. It's 
always a pleasure having you. And got to say, keep enjoying your Air King and your Seamaster. I think as a pairing goes, so peculiar. And it's such a different collection to what we normally see, right? Uh, OK, Eric Bell. Now, again, I've got to say thank you to Eric for sending in the whiskey that started the show. It's been great, actually. It's, it's gotten me really headstrong. 46% bottled. Uh, stunning. If you go to the beginning of the show again, you'll see the, the bottle itself. It's a beautiful whiskey, I must say. Really taste lots of tannin, lots of peach, no peat, which is superb. SG saying Pelagos blue or black. Oof. Again, if you like my attention a bit better, uh, tag me in the chat because as it is, the chat just goes wild and I miss a lot. Um, Pelagos blue or black? I would go blue. I don't know. We're going to be seeing a black one later and you can make up your mind because the black does look so good as well. So Eric Bell wearing a 50 millimeter Aragon. Now, Eric is a very enthusiastic diver. He is a, a Navy man, spent most of his life training people in the Navy, and he has dove or dived hundreds of thousands of times with submariners. He's got a full set. He loves watches that are like the perfect sweet spot for him is 50 mils plus, which I think is hilarious. Um, and then his two Siamese cats. So what do we say? We have mouse and wee man. I think mouse on the left and wee man on the right. Look at those eyes. One thing about Siamese, the way they, their eyes are just absolutely incredible. And animals in general, if you want to send your dogs, your cats, whatever else, go for it. I mean, that's what makes these shows such a joy and a pleasure. Speaking about this piece, I think, oh, I like this. Matching the red with the red sub date in the corner, the hand, the symmetrical layout of all the batons, that the handset reminds me of a, of a Seiko Samurai. I don't know if it maybe uses a Seiko movement. I don't know. Uh, but as far as a sports piece, I don't know anything about Aragon as a brand. Might need some help. My loomed eyes, Ryan says, that's great. Uh, I might need some help understanding the brand fully. I know many have been getting in the community lately, uh, but as it is, looks great. Nice, I must say that what makes it sing to me personally is the color, the use of reds. And speaking of use of reds, if Mr. C is in the chat, you're going to see a stunning watch in a second. Uh, Freddie Turner now sends in a Smith's Air Ministry. Had this watch on a couple of weeks back. Uh, this was a piece that I reviewed recently for, for Time Factors, for Eddie. And I think as far as a watch that represents the, six, the 6B and the whole development of the RAF-inspired watches from the time, I tell you, Eddie is doing such a good job. The, the watches that he makes, again, I'm not spruiking the brand. I think the pieces are stunning. This uses a, a manual wound ETA movement. It's got proper heat-blued hands, uh, domed crystal, and again, it pays tribute to a watch that was made in and around the, the late 40s, early 50s for RAF pilots. And it's just so much fun. It lets you step into the shoes of wearing a vintage, but you can enjoy all the, all the fun of a modern piece. No hang-ups whatsoever. So thank you for this, Freddie. We're moving next to your Zenith. Chrono Master, did I say? Chrono Master. And what else? Is there any more detail to it? I don't think. El Romero. Okay. So here we have the full calendar by the looks of things, day, date, month, moon phase. And what caught me and my attention was the bracelet on this piece. I think the way they've done the bracelet with the lugs and everything else, it's very classical. You know, you can almost squint at it and think it looks like a brega in a sense, no? Raymond from South Africa, what a pleasure having you here. It must be, it's, it's midnight there at the moment. What are you doing watching the show, Raymond? Uh, thank you for joining, really. Everyone who's a part of the show, again, I'm missing so many of you in the chats. I'm trying to keep this on schedule and run through the many pieces on show. I don't know how well it's going, but uh, I must say, Eric, I loved, I loved the loom, cat's eyes. It's funny, so good. So yeah, I talk about Zenith. The El Primero, they are so, we've once done a, a show where there were about, eight different El Primero Zenith, not just talking about the one that we know, you know, the, the A386s and the A384s, you know, the, the, the modern ones that we know so well of today, but there's so many variants within the line too. Zenith as a brand, I mean, if you want something that represents the automatic chronograph, not much comes close to Zenith and what they do and the movements as well. I think he, yes, he did. He sent me a movement shot. We get to enjoy all the little finer details. So 31 joules, I, Again, I'm not a movement junkie, so you might need to help me here in a few places, but uh, finishing all of those details, it's a column wheel, so you get to appreciate it. I don't think we see the column. It's probably down here somewhere. But yeah, I mean, it's such a great, again, talking about daily wearing watches, it's such a great setting of pieces. And uh, it's you're going to see that all the way through the show. James Conn saying, are military homage watches jumping the shark? 
what's next a latrine supervisor edition <laughs> uh i think i think there's merit to where they are just because it's it gives people assurance that they can enjoy the aesthetics uh, and instead of you know worrying about movements and and servicing and all those details but again when they start exceeding the price of those original vintage watches that's when you have to kind of draw the line so if we're looking for a genuine 6b from back in the day you're looking at maybe a thousand two hundred pounds so like a thousand five hundred dollars maybe uh and that's for an excellent condition model and that's with, with all the tritium and everything there of course this doesn't have tritium but uh, you're looking at this this is like 350 bucks so it is down to personal preference I, I for one am someone who loves the vintage aesthetic but also enjoys the fact that it has the modern details behind it as well it's it's peculiar maybe it's not the best purest uh approach i'm sure many purists enjoy the fact that everything's restored and original but i mean this is coming from someone who owns a 57 c master the, the original uh recreation reissue and I just love the fact that you get to enjoy those aesthetics as well as knowing that you're safe, wearing it in the sea, in the shower, doing everything every day. You know what I mean? Okay, Freddie, thank you for sending those in. Next, we're jumping to Graham. And Graham sends in an extremely peculiar watch that we have never featured on the show before. But this lines up exactly with salmon dial watches that was a show presented uh, what two or three weeks ago i did a video about salmon dials and what they managed to do capturing that charm of the 30s and the 40s and that character i'll get to this piece now so graham sends in it's called a dreyfus 1925 and i just want to get to the chats i see demetrius saying just yesterday purchased an a384 Oof. You are going to enjoy it, Demetrius. Please find an excellent mesh strap. Maybe find the original Gay Frere bracelet, if it's possible, because I think that just completes the watch so much more. Uh, Junior Lee asking, what do you think of the new uh, the new releases of Nevada Gretchen? I can't do that right now. Running the show, I'd have to minimize the window and go online and have a look. I haven't seen the images. Sorry, I've been quite behind the game looking at uh, everything in between. So. We can definitely do it in the following week when we talk about a more open-ended subject, for sure. But Dreyfus and Company, handmade Switzerland, never heard of this name before, this brand. But the background behind this is he says that it's a watch that he wears, he's been wearing for 10 years as a daily work watch. And I think this is what inspired the show, actually. I think this is the piece that began the whole thought of talking about daily wearers. It's the most peculiar daily wearer we know, right? Uh, and what was i going to say there was something else oh we've just hit the 60 minute mark for those of you who are catching up with the show i would imagine the show is going to be a roughly three hour show the first hour of the show won't fully process after the show's ended for a good day at least youtube is doing some weird things with its algorithms and processing times so just a heads up for anyone joining uh, at this point in the video you've missed 60 minutes of the show but don't worry 24 to 48 hours you'll see the rest of it tell you all the little details you have to try and clarify when you're presenting james says it's a great watch really be interested in knowing more about the brand because i love the way they just do things like the typeface and the skill of shea and the hands i don't know if this is all heat blued and everything in between if, if this is true to form is this a steel case is this white gold i i have absolutely no idea i'd love to know more about this brand in particular so maybe graham if you're watching at the moment please let me know because uh again it's a cool looking piece this is the only salmon dial we're going to be seeing on the show, but I think uh, it just evokes that charm of a different time period without showing its its age uh, from a wear sense, a wear point of view, talking about tropicalization and everything. Case back shot, there wasn't one. Sorry, Junior, he didn't send one in. He just sent the dial, sadly, but I feel like the movement would be incredible, no? Circle around the date window. That was another point. Uh, I, I don't know what that's about. It's pretty interesting though kind of reminiscent of a Bauhaus approach but then you have these these Breguet inspired hands in a sense interesting piece I'd love to have a look at it in more detail just hear about the brand as it is next you won't believe we'll be jumping to next but another Aquaterra <laughs> and I think I think this is virtually the same being a blue I think this is the exact same variant that we saw earlier blue strap blue numerals and everything but I just love the way this photo was taken because you get to see how the light just plays on it so nicely. Silver, what a great placement and setup. Uh, and the rest of the chats going on here again, I'm missing you all. Sorry about that. Uh, 
Blue hands on a salmon dial, something great. Raymond, I agree. Surely, I absolutely agree. Mr. No Date saying good evening, and you're sweating. Trust me. It's 30 degrees in the room right now where I am. It's, it's bad, really bad. But all the colors, I mean the blue on blue, the silver dial, this is exactly the same as the watch that we saw earlier, I think. But they do a great job. I think the horizontal slats on the dial add something, does make it look a bit more. I found that when we saw the, the earlier generations with the vertical lines, it seemed to be a bit too conflicting with the way that the dial worked. Being horizontal, you actually get to appreciate the batons and everything better. It's probably an easier reading watch because of this arrangement, uh, because you know, everything is generally vertical. When you look at the way the hands have been done, the, the batons themselves are all jagged and sharp. I would imagine the straight lines going vertical would probably break up your eyes a little bit too much. There's so many things. Again, at the beginning of the show, I said the one element that makes this watch difficult is that because everything is so symmetrical and, and clear, you can't read the dial very easily at a glance unless you've trained to read the dial well. Okay, going to carry on through. Hamido, thank you for sending this. You also send in some more stuff. Let's get to the Reverso Classic Medium. Oof, this is a gem. And as far as Reversos go, this is what you want. Gorgeous serifs on the dial. You get a sub-seconds layout here. Again, next week we're looking at watches. I probably spiked the microphone. I'm, I'm definitely trying to tone down the volume as much as possible. Uh, I miss the flat dials of the Aquaterra. Oh, Demetrius, that's a good point. I mean, before that, they had just plain, basic, simple layouts, right? So come next week, I'm putting a video out looking at watches in film, how to perfectly cast a watch in a film. And there've been some exceptional choices. And the watch that actually inspired the film, the, the whole discussion was this, worn by Bruce Wayne um, in the Nolan series, in uh, for Christian Bale wearing this watch. All three of the Batman films, he's wearing a JLC Reverso. And when we talk about him as a character, and this is what the whole basis of the video is, we look at how these watches are further extensions of the character. This piece does such a good job. The reverso being something that shows a different image when you when you reverse the face around, you know? And him being Batman, his true face is the superhero and Bruce Wayne is the mask. And I thought it's such a nice area to talk about. There's lots of characters that we can actually focus in on talking about the film space. And what makes the reverse so, so good, of course, turn it around, you have a, a solid back. Wondering why they polished the back of these, though. That's something I've always found a bit peculiar, because this gets scratched to pieces. And you've got to ask, you know, you're dealing with a watch that is going to be used in, in a rugged situation, possibly, maybe. Uh, you think, why have it fully polished? And isn't a brushed finish a bit more practical? You know, The devil is in the details, Shaitan says, absolutely agree, for sure. It's a great looking watch. I think he sent in another shot of a presentation, but this lets you see the texture on the dial and just the way the bat, the numerals have been done. Now, our man Curtis, who might still be in the chat, he, uh, he says to me that the Explorer is just a no brainer. That's a watch that you must get next. And then for an anniversary of some kind, pick up a Reverso as your third piece. And I, I'd love that. I think as a, as a three piece set, oh, a Reverso would be good. But there's so many options in this line too. I think as far as the brand goes, you want the, the classic is this this arrangement, this numeral arrangement. The sub seconds adds another nice feature. Also really enjoy that it's all rectangular arrangement. So you get to see all the little highlights and accents there. Um, and Astro saying, are you taking submissions from viewers from their film inspired watches? No, no, not at all, Astro, no. Uh, this was just a happy accident that he sent in a reverso. The, uh, I've, I've been enjoying oh, another another piece. Hold on a sec. Got to go back. It was just something that hit me over the course of this week. Video inspirations just hit you like a brick. You're just sitting there and thinking, why not just approach it a different way? And that's how you know, this, this uh, video is going to be prepared. But it was a lot of fun to look at. I think I looked at about 15 different films and broke down just how the watches represent their characters, some, some better than others. Um, and Astro, I do these shows uh, once every two weeks. So next week, we won't be having wrist shot week, I don't think, uh, but we will carry on through. I've got to keep my sanity up somehow. One thing I wanted to say is that this model, what makes it even better, dealing with small seconds and everything else, but you also get a deployant clasp. And you've got to enjoy a deployant on these watches. 
it's sad that they don't come standard with deployments, most of them. But uh, yeah, the Reverso is a real gem. And as far as representing the watch and what it stands for, this is probably the best modern interpretation that they've done. Again, daily wearing. This is absolutely phenomenal for a daily piece. Next, we are jumping to Hoplite. It looks like he's wearing Sebagos. Hmm. I love me a good pair of Sebagos or Sebagos or whatever you want to call them. Now, so we, we call him Hoplite. He also, aka Miles Chavis, aka Mike. He has many names. But this is a Mark I Explorer 1 or Explorer, whatever you want to say. You usually denote Explorer 1 just to help those who are starting the hobby. Sperry's, really. Oh, that's you. <laughs> Thanks for, for their Sperry's. Okay. I was thinking they were Sebagos. Still a great brand. Uh, I would definitely. Pip Sebagos over Sperry's, but that's just that is my my thoughts on the matter. You can debate it. I'd love to know which came first. Actually, I'm not someone who knows uh, the development of the moccasin very much. Was Sperry's first or not? Don't know. Uh, anyway, talking about the Explorer Mark One and just the way the dial's been done. I think this is one of the best photos of the Explorer here. We can see it. So the reason for my choice of this, I'm I'm really thinking thinking long and hard about what makes this watch appealing to me and it's it represents the modern movement of rolex as a brand as a family that's why i like it so much i've picked up the classic seamaster from omega and thinking that wouldn't it be nice to pair the same kind of aesthetics next to uh, a modern rolex inspired variant and uh, as it is it's a great looking watch i think the the white gold indices this is probably going to be very collectible one day just talk about this next to the Air King as an extremely collectible watch. I mean, thank you for the super chat, man. Thank you so, so much. Um, talking about this this piece in the family and this line with the T-Rex hands, it's hard to really notice unless you see them side by side. The white gold uh, numerals on the dial adds an extra element. And I was wondering recently if the bezel is ever so slightly different on these models. I have a feeling that this bezel is a little bit more domed next to the, the, the Mark II. Someone might need to correct me there. But as far as it is, I think it's just such a, such a cool watch. Also, enjoy the fact that you're enjoying your summer with the right shoes on. Uh, <laughs> I wore Sebago's in Tobago. Fuck, thanks for that. And uh, there was this great question, I think, by uh, from Chi Town saying, Sperry Topsiders, great summer smart casual choice. I own a brown pair. Sperry as a family. I don't know so much, but they are the American equivalent, right? They are the, should we say the, the what, the Ford versus Ferrari competitors in the space of uh, dockside shoes. Okay, Hoplite, thank you for sending this in, or Miles, as you're in the chat. And there's all about proportion and balance, Reed. Again, there's, there's actually some great questions asked of me about this piece. I criticize this a lot, running through the numerals. I think the numerals definitely show the modern side of what the brand is trying to do. Size and presence, though, is something debatable. I'd need to have this watch on the wrist for a while before I decide on whether or not it works the best for, for my taste. Um, Tom Austin, great having you here, sir. But as far as a piece that represents the modern movement, again, if I remember, I'll put the link to the Explorer series, Explorer video that came out on Thursday in the corner of the screen for you to have a look at. But uh, yeah, I, when it comes to a watch, batons and numerals make me sing. I could have 10 watches that have this kind of layout and I'd be happy. It's, it's so funny how we as enthusiasts go through the motions and eventually find something that sings to us. I, I must say I adore the Submariner, but there's just something more to numerals and batons on a dial that appeals to the, the designer in me, actually. It's, it's fascinating. That's what makes this hobby so great, man. Uh, Russell's in the chat. Pleasure to have you, Russell. And I think I saw Zane. Good to have you here, Zane. You guys sent in some awesome pieces that we're going to have a look at at the end of the show. And next up from James. Oh, got a nice movement shot. So James sends in a, let's try and get this right. It's a, it's a professional Speedmaster with a moon phase complication. And he does say that it's a very underrated watch that people don't look at much. Uh, it's something that they kind of oversee for what it is, but look at it. Uh, just looking, this is the first time I've actually had a close look at the dial, how they've ranged Seamaster and Speedmaster and Professional on either side of the dial there. Nicely balanced, I love the placement. And then you have the moon phase complication, you've got a full date setup. And what I think is even more special is that this is a manual wound model. And I mean, when you're talking about a watch that has all of that complication inside of 
a piece like this that has uh, no automatic movement to it just adds an extra level of detail, right? I think it looks stunning. It really does look superb. And being such a nice, high-quality image, we get to appreciate the movement itself. Uh, I think it does look sublime. Um, and I don't know what's going on in the chat here, but if I have to resort to looking at it, it's going to take up so much time. And yeah, yeah, I'm going to just leave it there for the moment. But anyway, coming on through. I really do appreciate this. Thank you for the, the movement shot as well, James. Really do appreciate the layout. And as far as dials go, we're going to be looking at a, very, a, a few very special perpetual calendars later on from AP and from Patek. And I think what this does, similar way, that that quad layout on the dial just sings. It really does look special. Um, so going to carry on through. And I don't know if this is the same James as another James, but would you believe we're getting another <laughs> another Aquaterra? Oh, geez. And this is the third variant in the same line. I think this was actually used as a uh, a promotional watch to begin the show. I think a couple of, a couple of days back. Uh, mentioning that we're going to be having wrist shot week this weekend. This was the photo. And it captures the silver dial very well. But again, this is the third, the third Aquaterra of the same exact same ilk, which I think is great. <laughs> uh, that's just awesome. Uh, and Russell, that's not the real Tim Mosso in the chat, by the way. I, I uh, Unless it is. Tim, send me an email. It'd be great to hear from you. I'd love to chat to your team. I mean, we did have Brian Goldberg on once, and that was a treat. So uh, it's nice to see that the the family is coming to, to join in, see what's going on. Uh, yeah, but as far as layouts go, again, Aquaterra, sublime. But Jeremy, and this is from James, and then Jeremy sends in, I think this is pretty exceptional. This was going to be the cover photo at one stage as well. But since uh, this is not a wrist shot, technically, it had to be put aside. But Jeremy is a professional photographer. As you can probably see by the layout, it looks gorgeous. And this is a uh, 16710 all black GMT. This is a sleeper, I think, in the family. We talk about the, the Air King as a watch that's desirable, that people want. But this, I mean, look at the serifs. I didn't even notice this. Check out the serifs on the bezel. This is something quite special. And on the, on the, the bezel itself at the 20 and the 22, I have a feeling this watch is going to be quite sought after in years to come. And it's, it's about this idea of having a better complication than just a, a date and a running hour. It's nice to see that you have a watch here that has a GMT complication that could have an excellent uh, under-the-radar appearance. Many would probably assume it was a Submariner, but then you get that flash of red on the, the hand itself. And the photo is such good uh, composition. You get to really appreciate the brushing all the little minor details on it itself. And I mean, this is what makes it great. We haven't seen many Rolexes on the show so far, right? This is this is pretty spectacular. And again, being a professional shot, I think this image was probably about 20 megabytes in size. <laughs> but Jeremy, it's it's an absolute treat. Please send more of these in. I'd love to see this on the wrist. You've got an awesome Zippo lighter there in the corner. Uh, got a ca Again, I'm not a camera person, but you've got some film there and Looks like a field, note, field notes page or book set up. Great composition. I think it does look stunning. And the shot is really what sells it, right? Uh, going to carry on through. Jeremy, thank you for sending this in. Next, we're jumping to Jimmy with a Black Bay 58. And there's another watch that we, we love to talk about very often. Still hasn't taken the stickers off. I think he might have gotten it recently. I don't know. But uh, and they're saying, do you like a, <laughs> is that a like a camera? I do not know. Flat fours, is that buck? Let me go back to that and have a look. I was wondering what made this unique. So being a flat four bezel, that's something collectible and sought after. Swiss made. So this wouldn't be a tritium dial. This is your, just as you hit that superluminova area, right? Yeah, me and my references. When it comes to vintage models, do struggle with the minor details. So another Black Bay 58, the, the cover photo for the show. I think it's a great starting watch, talking about daily wearing and everything in between. The gripes we've spoken about so many times. This piece with the, the Tudor snowflake hand that is so peculiar and strange. But next to the Blue Bay that's just come out recently, I think this one does have a bit more merit, all things considered. Jamie's saying that Rolex is the best. It's a great brand, for sure. It's a great brand. Uh, and I think Jimmy sends a few more as well. Let's have a look. Oh, so Jimmy is a pilot. Okay, I remember this. And we get another Explorer. It's amazing how 
pilots love their GMT complications. Huh? It's it's almost like it's ingrained into them that they need something to tell them a different time zone. And it's stunning. I mean, again, I mean, because of Archie Luxury, this watch became became as popular as it is nowadays. And they're getting really sought after. People really want to get their hands on them. And you, I, th I think in that Explorer video that happened on Thursday, I said something like uh, the, the Submariner and the GMTs and everything else, they're still very hot. People still want them. But this piece still rides under the radar. It's very plain and simple. It does a great job at being, again, it reminds me of a 90s era tennis watch for some reason. I always think of a tennis player owning this piece in and around the 90s when I was born. <laughs> and Anthony's saying we should have had a rotating bezel. I guess it's down to the charm of this watch that it's fixed, but it would be something. Imagine they like revamp the Explorer in a few areas. We don't know. Uh, talking about predictions, should I do another prediction video in, in September, in and around that time? Maybe comment yes or no in the chat. Who knows? Uh, but Jimmy, thank you for another one of these pieces. This with the engraved rehort. So I'd imagine it's the modern. It's got solid end links, solid case, no, no holes. So this is probably one of the last of the models in the line. Carrying on through to another shot from Jimmy, being a pilot again, I have never seen this before. This is an Orient Flieger. I didn't even know this existed. How cool is that? So we're looking at a type B dial here, right? An Ura type, Ura type B dial. And uh, Chaitan's saying, would Andre Agassi wear an Explorer 2? I think he would, you know? I really think it's the kind of watch that would suit him. His appearance, it's optimal. I think it's great. It makes it's such a versatile watch for what it is. Anyone could get away with wearing it. Ladies, men, anyone. And that's what keeps it in that bracket of being such a versatile watch. Even nowadays, people in this hobby, let me get back to it. Even nowadays, people who are new to this hobby, even those who are experienced, might struggle to recognize what this watch is. And when you think about <laughs> Tim Moss, uh, Orient's toxic sludge, uh, Tim, Tim, that's great. I can I can clearly tell it's it's definitely Tim in the chat now. Unless this is your alter ego, this is like the Jekyll and Hyde Tim in the chat at the moment. That's just great. What this piece manages to do is it just it, it looks so basic for what it is. It doesn't look like a Rolex per se, and that's what makes it win. You can wear it every day, and no one would even know. And jumping to the Orient Flieger. Never seen this. I don't even know if it's, is this a commercial model or is this something that's been modified? I do see it has Japan movement, so it probably was made at uh, the same layout with the PVD case. <clears throat> Again, a pilot appreciating a Flieger. You can't go wrong there, right? And uh, the Type B dial. I'm more of a Type A person who appreciates it. But funnily enough, we were looking at the Air King a second ago. Notice something missing here. I really feel like Rolex was banking on what made those pilot watches so special back in the day. And uh, I think it's great. I really think it's great. Uh, we're going to talk about an awesome Air King just now. So hold on to your hats. Jimmy also sends in a double shot. Wow. OK, he's got both. That's cool. So uh, both of them look to be the most recent, you know, the last of the last variants. GMT with a Coke bezel, Swiss made again, solid, solid end link, solid case, no holes. And then next to the, the Explorer. I mean, these two watches sport the exact same, exact same complication, which is pretty interesting. I'd imagine that they were built in and around the exact same time. So my question is, would you be owning these for liquidity purposes? Would you want to sell one of these one day? Which would you choose? Let's have a, let's have a vote here in the chat. This could be fun. Um, left or right? Let's say uh, Coke C for, for this watch or Explorer E. For this, which would you sell and which would you keep? Actually, let's just say, which would you sell? Comment in the chat. I'd like to know what you think. In my case, what I'd be picking up, uh, what I'd be saving at least, would be the uh, the GMT. What did I say? Coke for C. <laughs> uh, I think that's that's a superb watch all around. Uh, the color combination works really well for what it is. So most saying keep C. Yeah, I think sell the Explorer. It's an excellent at this point in time. The Explorer is definitely riding up in collectability. People want them because they're becoming desirable and so it goes keep the coke yeah i think the the c has it over the e that's great uh c and e both the explorer is cheap anti-napoli thank you for the comments everyone wow that's awesome so good sell both by a gold daytona jamie says well i mean if you talk about subtlety and everyday wearing watches these two pieces do a good job i i met an interesting guy once who said that he he had a fake uh coke uh pepsi 
and Coke Pepsi, what am I saying? He had a fake Coke Rolex on and it was quartz and he didn't know what the bezel was about. And I find that so strange. He was someone who was clued up about watches, but then he didn't know that the bezel was for the GMT function and not a dive bezel. So I think it's, it's pretty funny how uh, everyone goes about their days. Actually, just looking at this, I don't think the movement is the same. Look at the date window here, less serifs, and then looking at the date window on the Polar, more serifs, and it's bolder. Hmm, could this be the more uh, modern variant of the two, talking about the calibers? Again, me and calibers, don't even start asking me. I have no idea. Okay, getting back in. So, Jimmy, thank you for these. Next, we're jumping to Joe with a gorgeous Navi timer, a B01 on a, on a bracelet. I think he sends this in from New York, stuck in traffic or not, I don't know. But we get to appreciate what makes the Navi timer such, such a bizarre watch. One of the most peculiar watches in the uh, the modern arena, I would say. Shout out saying Coke Oyster is my favorite neo vintage. It is some, another watch that I think is going to climb in value and collectability and everything else. There's so many pieces out there, right? It's like you, you think about where the demand lies with the modern stuff, and then you think the neo vintage area, you know, early, late, late 90s, early 2000s. I have a feeling that there's some that are definitely going to stand head and shoulders above the others. Yeah, but it's a great looking watch. Next to the Pepsi, I think the Coke is much more subtle just for the fact that it's it's less in your face. The red the red corresponds with the red GMT hand and yeah, it's it's pretty basic to understand. But uh, yeah, talk about the Navi timer, slide rule. How many of you use slide rule? <laughs> uh, and Russell saying looks great and distinctive. It sure is. And, and saying too busy. That's the common complaint. I mean, it's just too much. Great question from Eddie saying Navi timer or Speedmaster. I mean... I, personally, I think the Speedmaster wins hands down as a piece that, again, being inspired by the Rodania line of things, the dial is not original to the Speedmaster traditionally, but being something built for legibility and for contrast and ease of use, I think the Speedmaster does have a winning streak there. But then the Navi Time is much older and also deserves praise in that arena. I don't know how a pilot could ever use the slide rule while flying because it's l like literally impossible. It's, it's, it's virtually impossible to read the dial just you know from sitting in a room wherever you are, but uh, using it as, as a functional instrument on top of it. I think, as Russell says, being a distinctive watch in the family, that's its greatest selling point because no other chronograph in the line really does represent this simple, what should I say, complex arrangement as well as this does. It's instantly recognizable. Next to the Speedmaster, instantly recognizable, you know? And Julian's saying, do Zinn own the Navitimer copyright? I'd actually love to know that question because that was a, a great talking point in the Zinn video that happened weeks and months ago. If anyone would like to highlight that in, uh, in the chat, that'd be good to know. Dino's saying that Speedmaster, because you don't need physics degree to read it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the one aspect. It has everything. I mean, it's got a, a full-on, it doesn't have a compass on it, no. It just has a full-on gauge, gauge arrangement and all sorts of numerals inside. I do like the fact that it has a rotating bezel, but still, it's, it's complex. And everything is polished. All the batons, all the hands are polished. So reading it in direct light, it's difficult. And there's mention from David saying, finally a Breitling. Yeah, I agree. It's nice seeing some variety for sure. And again, this being the B01, I don't know where this sits in the in the ballpark of being a reissue or if this is a modern variant. I'm not the best with, with uh, Navi timers. I need to do a video about them. Actually going to make a note about it uh, very soon. But uh, yeah, as far as Breitling goes, represents the Navi timer very well. Uh, taking a hit from the water and getting back in. So Buck's saying that Zinn bought rights, but Breitling still has it. That's great. Eh? I mean, Zinn as a brand, I'd love to do more videos about their pieces. They're, it's it's incredible running through their chrono, the, the, what I'm saying, catalog, not chronograph. Everything, the EZM line, the UX line, the, just the standard, uh, the 5.56. Five, 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 We're going to see some of those in a second, actually. Great looking watches. Okay, I'm going to carry on through next to John. And John sends in, and I love this story. John is an engineer, and this is a Speed Seamaster from 1996. And let me try and remember this. So he says it was a graduation present given to him by his father, I think, uh, mechanical engineering. And his 50th birthday is next year. 
and he is looking forward to owning his his grail as a 50 fathoms and i think that's awesome he's been wearing this watch as his daily driver again linked to this theme and the subject of daily driver watches a 1996 seamaster chronograph which is a very peculiar watch we can we can get into the details now but i think it's also titanium no it's a titanium piece in the family too that's special uh as a graduation gift that he's been wearing all the way through and for his 50th he wants to get himself a 50 fathoms talk about the king of one of the king of dive watches and buck also mentioning that the zin uh, five, 756 that's the the navi timer inspired model or the one that inspired the navi timer i want to look marcello welcome to the show we're going to get to you soon you're in here somewhere thank you for sending me that i, I was going to save your uh, the photo that you sent me of your product but i didn't in time but I must commend you on what you've done with that uh, wine layout. I want to get to that just now when we when we chat about this. Uh, the mother of Pearl later in the show. Yes, it is. And this might be you, Astro Fantastica. I think you're the one who submitted it. No, uh, it's great. So this just, just talk about this piece for a sec. We've been running for 90 minutes, an hour and a half. That's phenomenal. We've done a good job. And again, if anyone's joining who hasn't seen the rest of the show or joining uh, after the fact, the show is finished. The first hour and a half of the show will be uh, saved and only processed 24 to 48 hours after the fact because it's 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 uh, YouTube's having a problem with its algorithms. <laughs> Astro's saying maybe that's great. So this piece, this arrangement, this just doesn't. When you look at it initially, it doesn't look like a Seamaster much. I'd say the thing that that sings to you is the bezel. You understand that it's that that era, the the Brosnan era of Seamasters, and then you have a look at the dial and the arrangement. This was brought out right around the time when we saw watches like the Overseas take shape. And didn't the AP Overseas have a similar dial arrangement to this? Um, I really do like just the offsetting of how the, the text works next to the, the subdials. Does look superb, really does look good. A little bit too much text. I mean, this is like modern Rolex in the amount of text they've used here. But then if you squint your eyes and you look at all the details on the dial, Look at how well those red accents work at all the points around the dial itself on all the tips of the hands. It looks great. It does look really nice. It's it's still strange. A diving chronograph in the line. I think that needs to be a video by itself. Diving chronographs and talk all about the peculiarities. I would imagine you can't operate this underwater. You'd have to let it run while you're before you jump in. Uh, Rolex text. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a little bit excessive for what it is. But this was made in 1996. And you got to think it's it's pretty amazing that they they did it back then. Uh, strange looking watch. Got to love the wave dial and and all the quirks that made this watch so popular. The bracelets and and everything else. Still. Helium, helium release valve, I think, is definitely not for uh, for everyone. But he's worn this watch. I mean, you can see what I also like. I don't know if the screen will pick this up. Look how faded the, the tip of this hand is next to the other on the dial. You can see that it's been sun bleached over time. I think it's just, it's just hilarious. It's great. It's really nice. And as far as a Grail watch, John, go for it. Get that 50 fathoms and enjoy it. Because when you talk about a dive watch that really set the standard in the 50s there's not many that come close to it right okay i'm gonna carry on through to jonah next and if we have another omega oh yes mm. now we had a look at the smith's air ministry at first this one is something quite a bit more special and i'm going to run through the specs he gave me a full description of this model uh the chats are great sorry that i'm missing you all here again i'm i'm struggling to keep up keep in time um, how many crowns do you really need on a watch? And that's the question. And uh, how many, th that one has what, four or five? <laughs> uh, it does get a bit excessive, right? Um, and that's that's one aesthetic detail that makes the diving chronograph such a strange animal. Something that works with all the pieces that they have way too many crowns. Uh, not only the Planet Ocean line, I think all the modern Seamasters have the same layout. And it's just, yeah. And Dear Artifacts saying it's beautiful watch. Okay, so let's talk about this piece. Jonah. He wrote me a long email and didn't attach the watch in the photo. And after the description, I said, where's the photo? Send it right now. So it's called a 2179 from 1944. Now, we must remember that in, in the 40s, we're dealing with uh, the war going on in the early years. And the European suppliers to the, the British Armed Forces say, we saw the Dirty Dozen. 
On the American side, we saw brands like Elgin and Hamilton, but because they were so slammed in America for watch manufacturing, they requested a special batch of Omegas to be sent to the USA. And this is one of them, a 1944 variant. And let me just look at the description here. He says, US military ordered out of um, straight out of Omega's catalog. This is not actually a mil spec watch, which I think is even better. I think it just adds so much more charm to it. This is actually a catalog issue piece from the time uh, because they were that desperate. You know, they just wanted watches for their, their soldiers and everything. I mean, we have this awesome, you know, stitched canvas sort of strap that very reminiscent of that timeline. Gorgeous handset, blued layout. I love these old logos. And uh, the quirks behind the original Omega logos was there was no set standard to how they arranged them. So you find every Omega logo has some slight difference to it. But of course, what makes this watch work so well, as many have probably noticed, the, the numeral layout on the dial is gorgeous. It just, it is such, the way they, why brands don't radially arrange their numerals anymore or often enough, it's beyond me because there is such a clearer it's just so much more pleasurable on the eye i think uh some do it better than others i think the one you know cliche brand that we think of the most is the uh the jean chronometer blue any any jean uh model really they tend to arrange their dials that way but this being a watch out of 1944 you know huge crown everything all that spec you would expect to see no he also sent in the case back of the watch, which I don't know how practical it is to look, but it says US Army stamped at the back, which is good. Uh, but I really enjoy this piece. I think it's something pretty special. And if John is still watching the show, who just sent in the Seamaster, you won't believe what watch is coming up next. Talking about Blancpain. I always get that name wrong, I'll tell you what. Uh, James saying, stunning looking Omega. Would, would a Dirty Dozen piece definitely does have that same kind of uh, language around it, no? Uh, it's gorgeous. It really is something special. Everything from, I mean, the way you can really tell this is a watch from that time period is the the minute track. It just looks like a, a ruler, you know, a generic ruler. It's it's awesome. I don't know what this watch was technically made for. If it was, you know, aimed at being a field watch, or if it was aimed at being something for astro navigation, or if this was just the style of the time. Uh, again, straight out of Omega's catalog, not specced for the military. Uh, yeah. And they're very rare because, you know, how many, I think they only ordered like one or two batches of these pieces because they, you know, they were kind of desperate back then. So Jonah, thank you. This is one of my favorite pieces for the show. I think it does capture a different side of the vintage space. And we were talking about daily wearing watches. This, this is it <laughs> made for telling time. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay. And next up, this is going to be something a bit different. <laughs> how often do we see this piece? JP sends in this model. A Blanc, I always get the name wrong, you know, Blancpain. Again, I'm from South Africa. I, me and European languages, got to try. Uh, a Blancpain Le Mans, reference 2125. <laughs> it's it's absolutely, for, for a moment, I thought it was a 50 Fathoms. The case looks almost exactly the same as a 50 Fathoms, right? But you must realize that this is a, a proper tourbillon, everything arranged there. And I find it to be such a peculiar watch. We can definitely look at it in more detail. It's got an eight-day power reserve, something special there, automatic. And it's got your, your date complication in a separate window. It is such a peculiar looking model. I don't know what it is about the piece. It reminds me so much of, of, a, of a diver. But then the way the dial has been done, it looks so much like a pocket watch. And holy cannoli tourbillon. Let's get right in and have a look. He did also send a movement shot. Do not worry. We'll enjoy that in a sec. But uh, this is, of course, one of the most sought after complications in watches. And it's one of the most useless complications, too. It's so funny. I think next to this, the one higher up is the minute repeater, right? The tourbillon is supposedly the, the dream, the dream of, of the complication. And it just has like barely any relevance for, for balancing out the movement when you're wearing it on a wrist. But uh, as far as aesthetically, so what they've done here is they've tried to take the inspiration of the diver style case, but then incorporate the dress, or should I say the pocket watch nuances inside it. And just funny, like peculiar things like the, the skeletonized hands. It's so strange. 
it just feels like i don't know what they is this supposed to be a sports watch i think he did give me more specs he did okay so this this watch measures to be 38 millimeters by the way so it's actually a very good size 38 millimeters 100 meters water resistant eight day power reserve yeah with a tourbillon <laughs> it's so bizarre I don't know what era this comes from. And, and Buckles is saying the Romans at the six. Notice that. I didn't mention it. Uh, it does look it, that that also plays to the the idea of it being a pocket watch inspired piece. Inspired piece. Anything to do with a tourbillon, you just immediately are drawn to the idea that it's a pocket watch in, in history. Seamaster-ish hands. I mean, that's it, right? Just bang on. Let's get back to the Seamaster and have a look quick, just for a bit of emphasis. They are virtually identical. The one thing that the Seamaster did was put a rounded plot on the on the hour hand. But I just think it's great. It's such a peculiar, one of the most peculiar watches on the show, for sure. It's all gold. I think it's rose gold, 18 carat. It's a sports watch. It's got 100 meters water resistance. But then it looks like a you know formal dress piece as well. It's bizarre. But anyway, let's get to the movement because that's the money shot. And it looks sublime the way they do the engraving on the balance and, and everything in between there again i it's one of the most peculiar i think it is probably the most peculiar watch on the show uh, zane definitely sent in a, a peculiar piece but this one takes the cake as being just bizarre for what it is uh nice arrangement i think it does look it's definitely not for everyone as far as a daily wearing piece talking about an eight day power reserve yeah i mean hell only need to wind it once but then it's being fully automatic. You don't even have to worry. So yeah, it's great. JP, thank you for sending this in. If you have any more peculiar watches, I'd love to see them because that's what makes these shows so good, right? Okay, going to carry on through to our man, Juan. And talking about movements and everything else. Okay, so Juan, who's generally, I just spiked the mic again, probably. Uh, again, if you haven't heard, I am very much new to this microphone, trying to get the, the sound calibrated okay. Don't know what it sounds like, but... Uh, Okay, I'm going to carry on taking a hit from the water and catching up here. So this is, wait for it, a 1936 Hamilton pocket watch movement inside this case. And I don't think he sent me the watch itself. He just sent me the movement. Now, Juan is quite the open-ended collector. He has all the modern pieces you would want. He has Breguets. He has the, the Hesselite Speedmaster, Vacheron overseas, all sorts. But his passion is collecting vintage American made pieces, especially Hamilton, Elgin. Uh, I think he has a few Bullivers as well. And uh, you will see one of, one of my favorite watches of the show he sent in. And it's a very special reverso, very special that he's given me a full description of around. So yeah, this is from 1936 Hamilton pocket watch movement. I don't think he sent the dial in sadly, but uh, as it is, we're going to carry on through to another Black Bay 58 on leather. <clears throat> and I appreciate that Juan sends in these shots with the loom shot as well. So we get to enjoy the, the subtleties of glowing loom on the dial. Dear Artifact saying, having to drop off. It's a pleasure to have you, man. It really is. And I'm so happy that I shared your, your photo as the cover. Again, if you missed the beginning of the show, I do realize I say again often, apologies. Uh, in the description of this video, you hit the show more button. You'll see a link to Dear Artifact's Instagram handle. Check him out because his photos are so professional, as I'm sure you know. Uh, it's stunning. So thank you, dear artifact. It's a pleasure having you. God, I love this arrangement. Did Buck say something? That's a Hamilton. <laughs> talking, about the, talking about the movement. Yeah. So uh, he's telling this piece, another 58. I mean, we've spoken about it to death. I don't think I got the details behind the leather strap, but hey, it's another 58. Got to love it. Carrying on. Next up, Boulevard Accutron, an original Boulevard Accutron uh, with a GMT arrangement, GMT bezel. I love these old pieces. They're really, I think the character behind them is something else. But then when you see these, these absolutely well-preserved models in the line, this is one example. He didn't give me the date, I don't think of this, but I would imagine it's kind of like around, I would say like late 50s, early 60s, no? With the bezel arrangement being solid. Um, it's great. I love the layout. It's very legible for what it is. Notice how the batons and the triangles work around the dial. It's it's peculiar, very peculiar. And I don't know if we have a glycine airman on the show, but this is, it looks like an airman. I just said, yeah, Buck, I just said it. It looks like an airman in a way. It has that same kind of effect, right? Uh, I really enjoy when a brand is able to take elements like jagged, jagged teeth 
and then batons at the quarters, mix and mash them. And then you have these, these circle plots. And what that does, since we're talking about a GMT complication here, you're able to look at the hours without having to read the bezel in the dark. Nice looking watch. And I feel like this was probably made in and around the same time as the Airman. Whew. Ladies and gents, it's, it's like 30 degrees in here again. So if I am slow in the, in the commentary today, just bear in mind that I am soaked <laughs> as I'm talking to you all. Uh, Accutron started in 1960. Thank you for that, Lester. Yeah, I mean, it does look great, right? And this, this watch is probably, what, 35, 35 millimeters, very similar to, this looks pretty big, actually. Could be about 39. Anyway, I've got to carry on. One cent and a lot more. So let's carry on through. Next up, mm, my beloved Mark II Explorer with a great guitar in the background. This is a Taylor T5. And there's another very special guitar that we're going to look at at the end of the show, close to the end, I think. Uh, excellent submission by Mr. C that we all have an, enjoy. And, and Russell's saying so hard. We're about 40, we're about 40 miles apart, Russell and I, and uh, it's, it's intense. I'm currently cooking. The computer is spooling up like mad in here. So yeah, I'm going to be dead. Good thing I have lots of water on hand, on rubber, as Ferron says. And yeah, again, you can see why I, I kind of like this watch. There's something so peculiar about the way the face is done here. The, the layout is regal or placid. I think the way the numerals have been done, it doesn't, it doesn't seem surprised. It seems very regal. I think that's the best word I could say. It's very, and it's very comfortable in its own skin. And I really enjoy that. Again, modern modern Rolex and everything in between there. I hope the day comes in a year or so. Who knows? But again, thanks for this, Juan. We're going to carry on next to the other piece. This is a Hamilton Electric 1957 Victor. And just after this, we're going to have one of the showstoppers, I think. Very special piece. Now again, uh, Juan is a Hamilton collector. I'm saying again so much. I've got to slap myself back into it. More water. Do you know saying the Explorer suits me? It's very relaxed. <laughs> I try to be relaxed. Thank you for that, Dino. Um, yeah, I love it. I, the, the, the layout, especially. The layout of that watch does it for me. I definitely don't want a watch that screams. At my age, what I do, it doesn't need to be a watch that stands out. And this piece, apart from the size, it does manage to ride under the radar very well. Also enjoy that cat's eye layout on the tailor. Juan, I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, keep it up for too long. Got to keep motoring. But uh, Hamilton Electric. So I'm guessing this uses the same, uh, you know, what, what is the movement that the Bullivers were using back in the day? This is pre-quartz, of course. So it had a, a tuning fork that, no, it didn't. It had, let me try and remember this again. It doesn't have a mainspring. The battery is your, your electronic mainspring. And the, the actual mechanics are virtually identical. It's, it's incredible. I mean, that's one thing that Juan likes to emphasize is just what the movements were like back in the day. And here's an example. We've seen so many. Every wrist shot week, you'll see a selection of these pieces of all shapes and sizes. Um, Juan Chaitan saying, am I a jazz master fan? Talking about the Fender jazz master. It's a strange guitar. I haven't looked at it for a long time, actually. Am I right in saying it's very similar to the, um, to the Firebird as a, as a Gibson model uh, in comparison to the two? As far as uh, Fender goes, I'm a Strat person all the way through. Strat with a jumbo headstock, that's my jam. But then I really do enjoy the butterscotch tellies, the originals with just one pickup. That's also stunning. Uh, yeah, but we're going to have a look, look at a gorgeous Gibson in a second. Anyway, let's get to one of the, the showstoppers, I believe. Okay, another Hamilton. Another Hamilton, but this is called the Otis Reverso from 1938. Now... You've got to ask yourself, why is it that you're looking at a, this is literally a reverso with a Hamilton dial and arrangement. And I love, I love the story. Oh, the trem system from Brian, Brian Wilson. <laughs> it's good. I mean, the Beach Boys, uh, got to say the Jazz Master does have a good trem, solid. It's, it's not a floating trem, right? It's, it's screwed right into the body. It's great. Okay. This is a special watch. And I want to talk about this for a second. The Otis Reverso, for those of you who aren't history buffs like me, I think you might enjoy this. Why are we looking at a reverso with a Hamilton printing on the dial? Well, it goes to show that Hamilton at one stage requested from Le Coutre or Le Coutre for a uh, reverso format. And uh, Le Coutre actually agreed on the, uh, the benefit of saying, let me try and get all this right, a 60 cent royalty to be paid for every watch sold. So they got the patent for the reverso, but had to pay a 60 
pent or cent royalty every time one of these were sold back in the day. This is a 14 karat gold model. It's definitely seen its time over the years. And he did give me some more details about it. Let's have a look. What else? He says, <clears throat> uh, Lakuta allowed Hamilton to manufacture. Otis ceased to be made simply because of the outbreak of World War II. And I think that's an astonishing history because everything about this watch looks apart from the Breguet numerals, or you could say Breguet inspired numerals. Uh, the, the way the, the case has been done, everything is, is just the same. The, the mechanics behind it allowed it to be a proper reverso back in the day. And there we go. An original reverso from 1938, not made by Lacoutte, but uh, Hamilton instead. I love that story. I think it's something quite special. Uh, adjusted for inflation, $2. <laughs> it's so good. That's <laughs> uh, so good. And then carrying on through, I mean, there's this, this is the watch being presented as it is 14 carat at the back. And this is it on the wrist. I love it. If you can find an original Lacoot Reverso, it's pretty special. And this is one way you can tell it definitely was. I don't know, when it came to sourcing parts, I don't know what they did. Did they actually request for these parts to be sourced and brought in? Because everything looks virtually identical to the line. Looking at the way the case works here, this fitting, is this actually flush? I look at it and see that it looks a little bit off center. That's funny. Uh, but another story, there was mention about the eight in the in the chat, the four and the eight and the nine. Yeah, let's have a look at them up close. It's this sweeping, I mean, it looks like a an Arabian sword, you know, that very, what would you say, a sultan, sultan sword in a sense. And then you have a look at the eight. This looks so much like Grand Seiko, actually this eight arrangement with that horizontal slash running across the open nine. It's so charming and guaranteed that if they had to do a six, the six would be identical to the nine. It'd be an open six as well. It's almost like, it's almost like an Arabic inspired Breguet numeral blend. Wouldn't you think? Uh, looks great. And, and Forbin says Reverso tells world time in my is my secret. Oh, geez. Okay. Well, I mean, that's nice. Having, having the back end, having the second uh, component, the second face, but there's something special. I really like the fact that this is not an original uh, DLC and is in fact a, Ooh, that's even better. Get to enjoy all the details here. I think it's just such a great story. Nice development behind the line. It's very peculiar. It's definitely dated for what it is, but uh, Dina's saying a beautiful play of Arabic reverso combination. So, so my thinking again is it looks like the, the blend of both Arabic, very like traditional Arabic numerals, as well as Breguet numerals together combined in a sense. Because you look at that, that open nine and that looks so much like a typical Arabic numeral arrangement that you would expect to see on a dial. And again, that's a classic. That's awesome. Juan, one of my favorite pieces. And what else did you send us? <laughs> there's the dial. <laughs> so there's the dial of the movement that we saw a second ago. And I have no idea what this watch is. There's no branding on the dial at all. Uh, I'd like to know more about it. If Juan is in the chat, maybe, maybe not. Uh, there's no script on it, but it has gorgeous Breguet numerals that we love. And it has the Hamilton movement from 1936. I feel like this is uh, a parts watch in a sense, because you've got the onion crown. It very much looks like a Flieger sized case. Uh, blued hands. I think he assembled this watch from bits and pieces. But uh, yeah, it does look pretty special. Pretty nice. I confuse Hamilton with Bulliver sometimes, Forbin says. I mean, <sighs> preaching to the choir. I'm definitely not someone who knows my American watches very well. Uh, Juan saying sterile case. Okay. Okay. Oh, it looks awesome. It does look so nice. And you've still got more from you. Oh, no, that's it. Juan, you sent it, you've sent us some awesome pieces for the show. Uh, the pocket watch movement. Again, we can have a look at it from 1936 and have a look at it. It looks brand spanking new. I think it's amazing. It is just amazing seeing how time doesn't affect these things as much as you'd think. Okay, next up from Julian, who was in the chat. I saw him a second ago. I did see him a second ago. AP Perpetual Chronograph. Now he sent in this watch a long time ago, a long way back. And what it is, it's, it's a watch that's inspired from, it, it came in, it was brought out in 2000, the year, in and around the year 2000. And does this look like an AP that we know today? Does it? I don't think so. <laughs> it's not something we expect to see from the brand, but this is what really was their bread and butter in the past, don't you think? Uh, I think the arrangement here is, this is something special. I, what Julian loves so much about this watch, as you can probably tell, is the way the blue accents work on the dial, the hands, uh, the strap, 
also found this peculiar that when I was looking at the dial, there's no printing of the brand anywhere. There's apart from AP at the moon, which is something cool. But then you see the, the layout on the bezel itself. And uh, yeah, it does look really nice as, as uh, Russell says, unique. And this doesn't, I mean, you look at this, you'd think it's maybe an icopod. You don't think of it as a, as a modern AP nowadays, no? He also sent in another shot, I think. Oh, did he? No, the two repeats, I think, all in all. This is probably the best shot to look at. So another small detail to highlight, this is, this is a platinum case. So this is creme de la creme, top of the line. And maybe if I rotate, it's probably easier to see. Whoops, magic mouse, work with me. Again, it's 30 degrees in the room. Everything's cooking in here. Uh, the nuances, when we look at the way the script has been done here, I feel like it's very, it's, it almost in a way reminds me of Lunga. It has a Lunga-esque script element to it. And also, we've seen this arrangement with AP watches as well. I'd really like it. The, the serifs everywhere, the fidelity is what makes this special. I think I said the exact same thing about this watch a couple of months ago. The fidelity is something phenomenal. Every, every line of script used, every, it looks like there's different emphasis on, on, on the numerals. And I mean, just looking at March and the, the actual months and the days and the dates relative to the, the numerals inside the dial, the blue accents, so peculiar. And as far as a daily wearing watch, oops, my headphone cable just got strangled. Uh, as far as a daily wearing watch, I think this is optimal. It's, it's pretty unique, no? Could you pull off wearing an all platinum watch as a daily wearer? Uh, and if this is a chronograph too, I forgot to mention, this is the full deal, the perpetual calendar chronograph, moon phase. Uh, and, and what makes this even better is that we've seen that nowadays AP does tend to, <clears throat> with their perpetual calendars, they have the similar dial arrangement. This is an arrangement they, they always used. Uh, but this suits this watch so much because the case, when we look at how neutral it is in appearance, there's no uh, aggressive lines or edges. It's actually very organic in its presentation. I'm just zooming it out so you can see it fully. You, can, you get to appreciate all the nuances on the dial better. That's the element that actually draws you in. The one detractor, I think, is it's very difficult to read. The handset, I mean, this is so traditional. These, these pointed pencil style hands must be impossible to read on the dial uh, when everything else is going on, you know? But uh, as far as a piece that pays tribute to that original uh, inspired pocket watch making, but also something very modern, I mean, simple things like brushing the bezel so that it doesn't get scratched. That's great, really unique and different. It's not something for everyone, but I think uh, as far as a watch that represents the brand from back in the day, this does a pretty good job. Again, from the year 2000. So this watch is over 20 years old at this point. And, uh, and <laughs> Bjorn says the loudest watch I've seen that is actually surprisingly tidy. Julian is in the chat, 40 millimeter case. Thanks for that, Julian. I, uh, it's cycled to I ci I've cycled to work with it. I mean, there we go. Uh, it's, it's phenomenal and superb. The color blue is also something I want to highlight. There's one very specific Lunga 1815, the chronograph, that has an all blue dial with a white arrangement there. And I think they've done a similar job with this color scheme here. It's, it's a very faint, almost baby blue. That works just so well in, in tandem. Is this strap actually original to the watch or is this aftermarket? I'd like to know that, Julian. And there's mention about midday sun. I'm pretty sure this has to do with the moon phase and, and how how it works don't know you'd have to let me know <laughs> arguably mo more useful than the navi lester yeah i agree you've got everything you would need on the wrist a perpetual chronograph is something that is so practical on a daily basis jean rousseau thanks for that julian talk about a watch being used on a daily basis to time anything and everything uh it's it's practical in that sense but then knowing the day date month knowing where the moon is it's it's a smartwatch. It's the, the, the classic inspired smartwatch, we could say, right? Uh, Delft Blue, perfect, Julian. Is that what they actually call it? Because it reminds me of, of ceramic painting from, from Amsterdam. There's a very special uh, word you'd use to describe it. But that 1815 that has that full, oh, it's so gorgeous. We don't have any, I don't think we have any other lungers. No, we do. We do have another lunger. And uh, yeah, just stunning. Thank you for this, Julian. Pleasure having a look at it in more detail. And then we jump to another Omega. <laughs> what can we say? This is from Kim, and he sends in the great white on a rubber strap. I've had a look, whoops, hit the mic. I've had a look at these pieces 
recently, especially this variant on a white rubber strap, and it looks so good. It does look so good. As a combination goes, this arrangement looks the business. Again, as a daily wearing watch, it hits the, hits the ballpark. It looks so good. Um, and what I wanted to say, addressing this piece, the, what they've done so well here is address the, the symmetry on the dial, the arrangement. I'm tripping over my words, people, because I am absolutely roasting in here. Again, uh, it's nuts. Got to hit more water. I've, I've probably lost half my body weight in the room. You cannot read that in the midday sun. Oh, you're talking about that dial. That's funny. Uh, okay, so uh, Dino's saying it's amazing on a white rubber strap or red rubber strap. I fully agree. I would even put money down and pick up one of these on a white rubber strap. Just have a look, at, try and look it up on Instagram or on Google. Just type in Seamaster 300 great white, ro uh, white rubber strap. It looks like such a modern sports piece. It just fits all, it reminds you of almost like an AP in a sense. Uh, that modern, we, we reached this point in the modern era where rubber is is the end thing, no? <laughs> and uh, yeah, go, go rubber. Uh, and what this watch does so well, this is actually an excellent example to address the, the accents and details they've done. The balancing on the dial is phenomenal. The size, on the other hand, a little bit different, a little difficult to to wrap your head around. Being forty-two millimeters, difficult to uh, to wear for a lot of people with with smaller wrists. I'm still I'm still banking on. I'll put a link in the corner to the video, discussing what Omega could do, bringing down the size of this watch to like thirty-nine millimeters or so. It would just work so nicely with with the bracelet and everything it comes with. But there are a few gripes, and you, it's so easy to identify the areas. I mean, the, the, the wart on the side, the, the hands definitely don't appeal to a lot of people. And there's, there's areas that you can improve in this zone. But of course, Omega has taken these aesthetics, made them their own at this point in time. Another thing that I'm a bit divided on is the, the numerals on the bezel. They look, you know, we were talking about the, the Explorer 1 and how that dial is arranged with those numerals. These look a little bit too stretched out for what they should be. I should maybe crush it just ever so. I feel like someone took this to the, the printer and stretched it ever so. I mean, we look at the way the date has been done. If they had a similar arrangement on the bezel, it would probably look a little bit more up to spec, up to our modern spec in a way. Uh, Forbin saying, I'm in San Francisco and it's foggy, 70 by the ocean. Oh, it's nuts. Can't tell you. And that's, that's Fahrenheit. You might have to explain that to me in Celsius because I'm a, <laughs> from Africa. I do, not investing on rubber can be really expensive. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's one of probably one of the best life lessons for the show. Not investing in rubber can be a very expensive ordeal in future. Dino, probably one of the best comments on the show. Uh, that peanut butter cup, as Miles says, yeah, wart, whatever you want to call it. Um, if I had direct contact with... Omega's creative team, the CEO. I would love to talk about how they could maybe reintroduce the, uh, I always get that reference wrong, but the MOD Seamaster. Bring back what made that watch so good with the large triangle at the bezel, similar to the 2254, that kind of arrangement, military inspired, but make it for the modern day, everyday wearer. It would do, so, it would do such a good job. Talk about sales figures. It would be so popular. 21C. Thank you, Buck and, and Michael and Ant and everyone. Lester. Yeah. So yeah, the 300, the 300. Yeah, the, the real 300, the original 300, no. Um, and Zane said, I'd rather wear this, this Omega over a Paul Newman Daytona. Well, I mean, it does a good job. Don't have to worry about losing a pusher and having to like, lease your car to, to pay it off. Uh, so Kem, thanks for sending this in. I think it's one of the best examples in the modern Seamaster line. Uh, and the white rubber strap on this, do yourself a favor, rubber B, find it, and you will not regret it. As a combination, it looks sublime. Next up, we're jumping to a completely, completely different model or watch in the family. And this is from Chrono Craze. Chrono Craze loves his chronographs, but he sends in a knack and NTH Fume dial. <clears throat> Nacken is a micro brand that's taken off quite recently. I think a few popular channels have been uh, talking about them and promoting them as a brand. Uh, Neferion says, how, how does investing in rubber help you or not cost you? Uh, put it together. It's not, it's not rocket science, right? If you're a male, you would understand. Uh, so this, this is a brand that's caught a lot of attention. I think they use uh, 
just standard Miyota 9015 movements. This being inspired by the uh, the Tudor snowflakes and all the rest. But as far as what I like about this the most, and the photography is absolutely phenomenal, the Fume dial I think is great. And it takes quite a lot of guts for a brand to go the extra step to start incorporating color schemes like this into their packages. It's so easy to just say, okay, black dial, black bezel, done. But to then go the next step and add some kind of effect on top of it, unique. What's also good is it's paid in tribute to the, the Snowflake 7016s. You have a Snowflake handset, but you also have a Snowflake dial. You have a date at the six o'clock position. It's a very nice modern take of what we think, I mean, as, as far as Pelagos models go, look at the bezel. I've got to say the bezel's nice. Um, and I think it's an acceptable homage, all things considered. I do think nod to history. Is that what, it's, is that what it means, Shaitan? That's funny. Um, I think it's acceptable in the homage space because it does take areas that we would like to see on the Black Bear line, say, and just you know improve on various elements. And they're doing well for themselves, from what I hear. Lots of promotion and, and lots of talk. Closest thing to a Tudor sub. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'm a bit slow tonight. I was thinking straps. <laughs> Very on, don't worry. And this is what, the two hour mark and I'm cooking in this room. So I'm not the best. Uh, and this is what I love so much about this piece, actually. This is an excellent loom shot. I would imagine it's BGW9, the, the industry standard. And this is called the Renegade. I should also mention, they call this the Nacken NTH Renegade. And it looks good. You get to see every little, why, why is it that brands like like Tudor, especially, why don't they emphasize their bezels? I think the, the Pelagos has the same layout like this. Uh, Rolex as a brand, why don't they go into this technology and put loom around their bezels too? Uh, I think it's it's a great looking watch for what it represents. It's not it's not for everyone. It's a micro brand as we know, but all these little things like the strap corresponding with the Fume dial, nice looking watch. I really do like it. Just and the photography as well. This was also a close contender to be a part of the cover because I mean it's exceptional. Last week you sent in a gorgeous, uh, what was it? Uh, similar to a I can't even remember that. Again, two hours in, my brain is mush. I need to hit the whiskey again. But uh, yeah, love, love that dial. Thank you for this chrono craze. Next to Lane with a Glycine Emin. We were talking about that earlier. And getting to the chat, there was a question about colors with straps. Let me try and get in. Neo, rub some dirt on it. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, let's see. So for when, uh, so Dino says it looks like a Tudor Rolex H. Moser love child. Why don't more brands do Fume dials? It's expensive, takes a lot of effort. And Forbin saying, do you prefer color in your watch and band? More monochromatic. Sometimes Pepsi colors feel done to death. Hmm. I'm someone who prefers the monochromatic watch with a colorful strap, colorful, bra uh, colorful uh, whatever, NATO strap, leather, whatever else. I'm in this, in this case, similar to this, I would say. But then my choices and colors are also very specific. It's it's a never ending story. You, you never you never win with me. Just keep it as basic and simple as possible. And that's the one that I'd probably jump on. Uh, Chrono Christ says it runs pretty great. It is a, it is a, um, is it a Seiko NH35 movement or is it a, a, a Miyota 9015? You'd like to know that. Um, the 6542 GMT Master had a loom bezel. It did, Shaitan. It did. Bakelite was the jam. I have never seen this Glycine Airman before. I called it the big date GMT. I don't know what it's, real call sign is it's got a 12 hour bezel very much in line with those original airmen back in the day it has three crowns i would imagine this crown secures the bezel uh this crown maybe sets the complication and then maybe this crown adjusts the date or the gmt hand i do not know but the one thing that really caught my attention at first was how the steel bezel has these slots cut into it i think that looks great really does look nice big date again this is something that you don't see very much. And I'm wondering if this is a full, like like Lunga's and, and German pieces, do they have two separate windows that actually rotate independently? I'd like to know that. But uh, as far as the Airman line goes, they're doing really well. And they appeal to the enthusiast. Back in the day, these watches were brought out as just pieces of equipment uh, worn famously by Vietnam helicopter pilots because they were just cheap, easy to use, Swiss made, practical. Nowadays, as a brand, they seem to be climbing the ladder, you know, upping their presence and their scale. Looking at uh, the way they've arranged their dials on this piece, it doesn't look too cluttered for what it is. It's got a full separate time zone at the set here at the base, as well as a large date and a rotating bezel. Very practical. 
talking about daily watches again, you can see where this theme has <laughs> developed over time. I see watches and giggles have arrived. Welcome, watches and giggles. Great to have you. I'm enjoying your prediction videos, by the way. Really am enjoying them. The retro future. I have never seen your name before, but welcome to the show. And uh, yeah, Glycine Emin, what can we say? Nice looking piece. And carrying on through. Thank you for this lane. Never seen this glycine in arrangement. Lester loves watches next with a Bulliver Accutron. And this was quite the trendsetter. This being something special, though, this is a 100th anniversary edition. It has an engraved clasp. I think that's what tells you uh, it is a modern piece in the line. And there we go. Have a look at the back. We can see looks superb. Does look sublime. Uh, so the Accutron as a watch using the tuning fork system, uh, well calibrated. And you've got to ask yourself, is it accurate? Is it good to have a watch that has exposed resistors and all the rest there? I think it's, oh, we talk about something that, that pays tribute, that enjoys showing off the mechanics. You get to appreciate the, the vibrations of the motors inside there. Um, and it has that, that, that buzz to it, right? It has like a hum behind it. I think it looks sublime does look sublime. And that's just the way it is. Got to enjoy it. So carry on through. I also really enjoy it. One detail is the orange highlights on the uh, the second hand. Does look really good. I mean, it just reminds you of that 70s era, right? So you've got the, the large cushion style case and just everything. Highlights, details. We've had a look at the 1655 GMT in the past. Lots of models from that timeline used the same aesthetics and the same details. Those uh, large plots that run around the dial all in all. And again, what makes this unique is the fact that it has an engraved or expressed 100 on the clasp itself. <laughs> Reminds me of clear Game Boys. I had one of those, Game Boy Advance. Oof, just very good point. Exactly the same. And it's funny how that technology that back here, back at this time, they were trying to, it's actually an excellent marketing ploy that I think they must have, it must have used back then. Because what it manages to do so well is show off the technology that goes into it. And it's ideal for that reason. Because you want to appreciate, again, this, this, compli this actual complication was groundbreaking back in the day. Uh, it was definitely quite intensive for what it was. And the quartz movement came in and swung in, changed. It looks like it runs on Maxwell battery. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's bizarre. So yeah, thank you for this, Lester. It's always nice. And then we jump to a more modern take on very when we just had a look at that gorgeous ap perpetual this comes in from marcello and it's the icopod isopod dual time <laughs> now all i know about icopod is designed by mark newson and mark newson being an industrial designer from australia i think what this watch does this is one of my favorites i've never seen this arrangement before but it's so neat i really do like it i can see why marcello loves this variant because it is, it's so crisp and it doesn't, it doesn't scream its presence. So for those of you who don't know much about uh, Icopod as a brand, it was brought out in about the 90s. I think it was introduced. And Mark Newson, as an industrial designer, he really made his headway and made his way into the industry through furniture. Look him up. Uh, the best chair, I think he did the, the Streamliner, this gorgeous lounge that he riveted out of just steel and it was aluminium. And uh, he's gone all over the place with, predominantly furniture. I've actually applied to be a part of his studio <laughs> a long time ago. Got a rejection, sadly, but uh, it was a nice a nice attempt. So Icopod is a, is a name that he's falling under. But we now know of the Apple Watch. And the story goes is that uh, Mark Newson and Johnny I have teamed up to make the Apple Watch. And Mark Newson had such a lot of input in the development of it because you can just see the small things like the integrated rubber strap around the case, uh, the brushed surfaces and all the rest. I would say Mark Newson probably had a good 70% of the uh, the innovative areas. I, I think maybe Johnny I have looked at the rectangle format and thought that was ideal, but Newson focused in on how the strap integration would work. And uh, can the strap be changed? I'm sure it can, Dino. This does look superb. Marcello, you've got a gem here. If you're still in the chat, and this remember, this guy is, he hasn't even graduated from university yet. You have excellent taste because this one does sing. I mean, I'm not someone who really enjoys when industrial designers put their hands on watches because, again, you know, they want to get their fingers in all the pies, but don't generally pull them off as well as they could. Uh, but I think as far as this one goes, orange highlight, 
it's so easy to read the time. All these little things, the way the subdials have been arranged. Uh, this is a winner. Really is nice. And Marcello also sent me a set of ceramic wine holders, wine coolers. Sadly, I didn't save them for the show in time. But uh, <laughs> Buck's saying, did Johnny actually listen to someone? Yeah, I mean, they're like, they're like bros. I think there's a deeper relationship between those guys and just friendship, honestly. Uh, they, they really love each other, those two guys. But uh, I feel like Mark Newson had a much greater role in the development of the Apple Watch. And I've got a rant about the Apple Watch. We could do maybe another video in future. But this is stunning. Again, Marcello, he was nominated for an award recently for a, a set of wine coolers that he did and uh, made of ceramic and everything. I want to actually write that email to you maybe next week congratulating you because you've done a good job there as well. Yeah, exceptional watch. This is one of my favorites of the show too. And I thought I'd never say that about an Icopod because generally they are just too much. This rides the line very nicely. And and saying loves the hands. That's organic. There's there's this genre has the genre quality to the handset, no? And actually, funny story, this watch pretty much pushed the style into the modern age. That's something to pay attention to. Uh, this this effect was adopted by Jean, but I believe that the Icopod was the model that really, or the family that really drove the development of this organic handset. Oh, it's a great looking model. It really does look so nice. Next up. Uh, exceptional watch. Can start, I've read that already. Modern art, as uh, as Matthew says. Jumping next to Mark Marcello. Thank you. Thank you so much for the submission. Such a, such a stunning looking model. Mark sends in the first Zin of the show, uh, three five six UTC. And there's something special about this model. I love this photograph. There's something special about this. We will look at in a sec. But there were some good comments. Um, Talking about Johnny listening to someone, <laughs> it's great. Uh, I'm glad you finally enjoy an Icopod. Marcello, that's the one. It does look good. The base of the hands is great. Uh, also glad you enjoy my coolers. They look awesome. I definitely want to critique one aspect around them. Uh, but come to think of it, you've done an excellent job with, it's all, it's all to do with line weight and translating the lines through the piece. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss it after the air. Um, okay, skeletonized syringe hands. So this is the first zone of the show, being a UCT timer. You just know that it's it's great for its purpose. But this one is one of the originals. It uses a Valju, hold on, Valju 7750. And I think the, the, the current ones are like Lemonias or something. I don't know. But uh, it's it's got a much more practical movement. And it's it's great because this is a very modern watch using an, a vintage-inspired caliber, no? And I just think you get to really appreciate what Zinn is with a watch like this. The way they do their, their pilot-inspired models with the numerals, with the syringe hands, and again, the, the skeletonized highlighted area that matches the UTC. It's a Flieger chronograph with a day-date. Comp is it a day-date or just a date? I think it's just a date complication. But yeah, as far as arrangement goes as well, great looking colors, lighting. It was mentioned about the dome crystal. Mm. Yeah, does look the business. And there is another Zin that we're going to have a look at in a second, I think. Does look phenomenal. Okay, going to carry on through. Love the Dome Sapphire. You can never go wrong with Dome Sapphire. This, this I would say, is more boxed than domed. There's very, like, technical terms we could, we could focus in on. When you say domed, you're expecting to see it almost arc into the center of the dial. This, we could say, is almost a, a semi-dome box sapphire because it only curves around the edges. So many stupid little intricacies with these pieces, but uh, yeah, it's great. And mentioning about, is it, it's an acrylic sapphire? I don't know. I definitely think it is sapphire because this is a modern piece. But yeah, Zinn as a brand, I need to do more videos about them because they are just going from strength to strength. I love, got to love the EZMs and the UX line. Go online and have a look at, what's the model? The U50 that's just come out. Something like 39 millimeters, and it's just a beast with red accents and highlights. Stunning. Um, it's acrylic, Mark. Oh, thank you. Okay. Well, there we go. We've got a, a, a domed acrylic, we could say. <laughs> and Tao is joining us. It's great to know. That's Tillman. You're going to see your watch in a second. Uh, ACCKK, it reads, Flieger on the dial. Don't look like that. Uh, sorry, didn't, I didn't catch that line. Again, it's like been three hours and I'm still rocking it. Okay, moving on next. Thank you for this, Mark. We're jumping to Matthew. Mark is actually the gent in the, tr in the chat. Thank you for that, for those details. Okay, so now we're getting to a very, this is one of the most peculiar watches on the show by far. 
an Orient three-star automatic, and he says that he's drinking, if anyone would like to know, any metal heads out there, he's drinking Metallica's, hold on, what did he say? Metallica's blackened branded whiskey in the background. I have never seen a date just, uh, what would you call this? It's like an, an Orient Day date inspired variant with, with a very 70s constellation style case to it. I don't know what this is. Uh, the, the gold highlights are quite nice. I do enjoy the blue dial. It's pretty unique. The U50 is 41, but still, Tom, oh, really? Got that wrong. I uh, was just looking at the U50 today, Junior Johnson. I, I tell you, if you want a German, a real German military inspired model, they just do such a good job. It, it's the same, it's the variant with all those squared components, right? The squared hands, the squared numeral arrangement. Um, it looks stunning. And it's a watch that I would definitely drop some money on. It's of all the pieces in the line, I think they've done such a good job with it. Uh, this blue dial is what catches your attention. No, it looks so professional. Uh, Orient Faux Royal Lion logo sucks. I mean, that's, yeah. So as a brand, I think when, when I think of Orient, it, it immediately puts me off just thinking about the name. I don't know why. It's probably because it, it feels like it's a watch made in China. I'm pretty sure this is Japan though, right? I, I don't know the full extent of the brand itself, but the name to me, and uh, you could say the logo with the with the lions on it, doesn't need it there. It's too much. It's way too excessive. If you look at the dial itself, you have squares and hobnails around the dial. It looks a little bit too much and loom in between there as well. But the dial is striking. I can see why he picked up this watch predominantly for the for the dial color. And then and, and Matthew's saying the logo puts me off. Yeah, it is a little bit too much could say tacky in a way. Matthew, thanks for this. I don't know if this is also from you, but you also sent in a Seiko Saab 033. Most most call, this is generically known as the baby Grand Seiko because of the immense value it offers. The What it is, hitting that, hitting that daily wearing watch scheme again, this does it, looks great. The black sub date window, mm, it's just simple. I don't think we have any more Grand Seikos on that we do, we actually do, but you look at it briefly and you would not be surprised if it said Grand Seiko on the dial. Uh, tonight, let it be Orient, <laughs> Buck says, it's awesome. Um, it is nice. We had a look at a few Seikos during the show. Oh, what's coming up next though? Just after we've looked at this vibrant blue, Matthew, thank you for sending in the Seiko and the Orient. Mr. C, if you're in the chat, Mr. C, we know as $1, the $1 man. This is awesome. So. We have a date just with a candy apple red dial. We'll get to the guitar in a second. It's a 1965 1603 with a refinished candy apple red dial with a 1560 movement. Okay. And then in contrast, he has a Gibson ES335. And it's just such a nice combo. Now, the last week we had the show, he sent in this gorgeous Oyster Perpetual with orange highlights. And uh, next to an orange amp, if you remember, if you, were, if you were following the show the other week, this time around it's all red. And uh, as far as guitars go, I've heard a lot of stories about Gibson. And I don't know if this is an original from like the 90s or from I know, the, the 80s maybe, or if it's modern, but they've had lots of issues with the way they do their binding on their guitars. It's sad because I've been following the, the business practice of Gibson and it seems like they haven't been doing very well in the manufacturing side. And Mr. C, one dollar. <laughs> That's what we know him as. I just love this combination. And again, he's he's a pedal nut. You can see the pedal board at the base there. That's just awesome. I think it's so so nice. And again, this watch is from 1965. I don't think this is an original dial per se, but it could be a service dial. I don't know so much. But things like the way they did fluted bezels back then, they don't do them the same nowadays. Even the crown, the crown sticks out a certain way. Yeah, red on red. It's one of my favorite shots of the show. When you can match your guitar with your watch, I think I need to do the same thing with my Seamaster next week and the Strat. But uh, yeah, Simply Red, Datejust. This lines up with what we were talking about at the beginning of the show, actually, looking at the, uh, the brown Whirlpool Seiko and the blue JLC Reverso. Wouldn't it be nice for you to be a collector who buys into certain watches of a certain color? They're very polarizing. I mean, if you're not someone who enjoys red as a color, you would hate this watch. If you're not someone who enjoys color on your watches, this is something that you wouldn't wear on a daily basis. But uh, I think, imagine having a blue dial JLC Reverso, red dial Datejust, a uh, brown dial Grand Seiko, et cetera, et cetera, a green dial Submariner. So it goes, 
and it's on a Hirsch strap, I think, yeah, as, as mentioned, with the orange tang there. Mm. Mr. C, strength to strength. Again, you've done a great job on this show. Uh, love to see some more color matching if you can. It's just nice. It's so nice seeing this. Now we're going to the next piece in this selection that we've never actually featured on the show before. Oh, Joe, you're talking about Gibsons. I collect Gibsons. The key is to play before you buy, of course, of course. Wildly inconsistent. But if you get a good one, they're incredible. Good point. Very good point. And Brian Wilson, uh, things seem to be getting better for their new Gibson management. Okay. Best to go custom shop if you can. I've seen all sorts of crazy stuff behind the scenes of them dropping necks into, into containers. Just so like non nonchalantly like there's no care behind it uh but in saying that i would you know custom shop you're safe i love the comparison between dropping i dropped my strat the other day and it landed in the sweet spot that would snap a gibson headstock landed flat on the back uh but you know as far as it is i love strats i love the sounds they make i would, wouldn't mind getting myself a les paul one day Actually, a hummingbird might be very nice. Okay, so Forbin saying, Red Rolex from 65 reminds us of the recently sued by Rogue's watch company. And I remember that. Yeah, that was, I think Paul Thorpe covered that. That was peculiar, right? And they lost the case to Rolex, no? So what we're looking at here, we're checking out a Christopher Ward C60. We've never featured one of these on the show before. And I think as far as the brand goes, I, I don't understand it very much. I don't know if they, they, they just use ETA movements, no? And we know that it's been a topic of conversation. It's very polarizing on this platform because of certain brand brand ambassadors. <laughs> I can't say brand, <laughs> brand ambassadors, but those presenting these pieces. Uh, one aspect I really do like about this watch is the, uh, the transparent dial. Reminds you of Lunga Datagraph Lumens and, and Zeitwerk Phantoms and much more expensive watches in the, in the line. But as far as what they've done here, this modern take, I don't understand the logo at all. That's one thing that I've seen recently. The way they've done Christopher Ward on the side here, it doesn't work. It looks too modern for what it is, I think. Uh, I do like the way they've done the bezel insert here with the blue highlight and then switch to silver, or is this a different kind of brushing effect? It's very unique. And funnily enough, we're going to be looking at, oh, that's hilarious. There's another one straight after this the right line. Um, there was a mention about Gibson Acoustic is separate, made in Montana. They're amazing, Joe. Mm, that's what I'm jumping on then. Uh, I used to have Gibson endorsement. There was also a mention about strats. Strats are indestructible. I've had three neck breaks on my 325. You are kidding me, Brian. And to finish those and to re... Oh, jeez. I feel for you, man. I really feel for you. And were these all from by accident or is this just because of string tension? I'd like to know that. I tell you, strats. Talking about an industrial design perspective, they are just bulletproof. Being being bolted together, telecasters as well. They were groundbreaking for what they did. Very cheaply made, but I mean, you can throw them on the floor. You can do anything and they'll keep playing. They'll keep in tune even. So C60, I've never seen this. I do really enjoy the transparent feature to the dial, but I think this watch tries to ride the line between the modern, the modern era, but much. It does look quite modern, but just things like, this is the Trident, no? That's something a bit peculiar. I don't know. There's all sorts of little bits and pieces. We could definitely discuss Christopher Ward at a later stage. But from Neil, we then jump to Norman. Thank you for this, Neil. Thanks for sending it in. We jump to Norman with another one. And I don't know if this is a, if this is a modern, a more, a more recent variant. Let me try and get this fully, whoops, fully on the screen. But this is called the C65 GMT. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get it to fit, sadly. The, the blue dial here is solid, and being a GMT complication, you see this hand is just right off uh, the 1655s that we know. Uh, and Mr. C, thank you for this. For $10, Mr. C, that's, that's 10 $1 Super Chats. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed yeah, that. That talk was great. Your, your orange highlights and your red highlights. Put some blue in next week. That would be nice. Um, yeah. Christopher Ward again. This is this a ceramic dial. I don't know. Again, the logo I don't understand. It's, it's very. They try to make it look Swiss, do they? This is an, it's an English brand, isn't it? I don't know. I need to have a look at it more in more detail. I do like the bezel. There was talk earlier about wishing that the Explorer had a rotating bezel. They could most definitely adopt a steel insert and a rotating bezel there. Uh, it just brings down the visual presence of the watch on the wrist ever so much. But the logo placement, I mean, people are complaining. I, I fully agree. It just doesn't make sense. Same here. It just does not make sense to me how it's offset. And even the typeface, 
the typeface, I mean, what is it like? Papyrus? <laughs> I do not know. Uh, they've definitely tried to take it in a new direction. They've changed the logos. They've changed all the arrangements. Hell, they're selling watches, and I mean that's that's important. But positive and negative space, as as Buckholm says, there isn't much of an understanding of that here, sadly. But to each their own. I'm sure it's an excellent everyday wearing watch. It's not recognizable, and with the, I love any watch with an orange hand gets props. Looks cool. Okay, and this is also from Norman Next. He sends in a grand Seiko of just your typical spring drive, SBGA373. <clears throat> Did I say anything else in the description? No. It's got a heat blued seconds hand. It's just next to the snowflake. I don't know what the price differences are between these two. Um, Foreman saying, is a brand name consisting of only lettering properly termed a logo? Hmm. Yes. Yes, you could say it is a logo. Uh, there's no real divide in that in that area. Anything that I mean, think of think of brands. Think, okay, close your eyes and think Amazon. Think FedEx. Look at those two logos and how they've been done. Uh, very much integral. And PayPal is another good example. Uh, Amazon and and FedEx managed to use colors. They managed to use different lines to communicate other details. So Amazon with that little smile underneath from A to Z, that's excellent because it was, it was originally a bookstore, right? Uh, FedEx, if you look at the, the divide between the Fed and the X, Federal Exchange, you have a gorgeous broad arrow in between the two. Use of negative spacing in between the text. When, when a brand is able to not only make a logo suit the typeface as well, you have a winning formula there. I've tried to do something with mine, but it's not, it's not ideal. It's good, but it's not, it's not great. eBay has a logo, yeah. FedEx, an arrow, Buckholm says, yeah. So, I mean, it's it's great. And Spring Drive, my new grail, Matthew says. Papyrus, looks like Calibri. Astro, you could be right. It probably is Calibri. I was just uh, spitballing. So, yes, in answering your question, and just checking out how they do it here, for example, Grand Seiko, this, this is such a nicely approached. I mean, they do not need to have Grand Seiko on the dial at all. I think it kind of ruins it in a way. This just this does it. You've got a GS, and it's in that that old style script, very gothic. It speaks to what makes it uh, Japanese inspired in a way, and what makes Grand Seiko just such a special name is that they manage to take everything that Seiko stands for. Talking about Spring Drive, you've got this stunning movement that does everything you'd want from something more electric, something mechanical. I like to compare Grand Seiko and say that it's almost like when watchmaking was given to the Swiss by the French and by the English. You know, they were they were outsourced to make parts. At this point in time, it seems like Japan, Grand Seiko, is taking on the Swiss industry. And hell, they're doing a good job, right? Tao, much love from Germany. Oh, it's a pleasure. I can't wait to get to your reveal. Uh, Tillman, it's his name is Tal in the, in the chat. He sent in a gorgeous explorer, his most recent pickup, and he's pretty much finished his collecting at this point. Okay, Norman, thank you. Gorgeous shot, by the way. Really appreciate the sunburst salmon dial. Now, we're going to carry on through to Patrick. This is something pretty special, and I'm trying to understand. I haven't even looked. I want to look at the textbook first. We've got Sigma. Can someone please Eula? So I guess we're talking about maths here, right? This is logarithmic differential equations. I don't know. That's Euler, Euler's, Euler's formula. Oh, I don't know. You're going to have to help me there. But uh, he's probably a mathematician, I think. Now, get ready for this. This is a cool piece. Patrick sends in a Polyot Sturmansky, Soviet issue flight navigator. And talk about a watch from the 70s. Ellipse, ellipsion. Can someone please tell me if this is maths or if this is science or whatever's going on? I'm sure there's a maths major in the chat. There's definitely someone who knows their logarithmics and their differential equations and, and all the rest. So this piece just looks like something straight out of the 70s, those, those numerals on the dial. You've got the typical, uh, I recognize this from so many flight masters that we know. Um, analytical mechanics in it. <laughs> Toast said, I don't know. <laughs> You're going to have to help me. Um, but everything from the numeral from the from the handset, the batons, the the arrangement, are just the case. Look at it. It's a cushion case, but also has this modern effect to it. Also notice how it has two crowns on either side. And I don't know what they all hold on. It's a compressor crown. So this crown I would imagine moves the uh, the inset bezel. This winds the movement, and then you have the chronograph pushes. You talk about a piece that's inspired by uh, 
aviation history and all the rest. Yeah, this is uh, pretty good. Again, he, he explained the name to me in the description. It's a Polyot Sturmanski, as in pilot. I actually got this wrong. So it's a flight navigator as a translation. It's a hip watch. Yeah, it is. And the colors, the colors do speak pretty well too. You've got white. Oops, hit the mic heavy there. Sorry about that. You've got white with gray. You've got the blue levels there. Yeah, nice. Polyot means flight in Russian. Thanks for that, Eric. Yeah, definitely looks cool. Uh, so strange. I, I tell you, what makes these shows awesome is that you can just see what everyone else has, and it's it can be the most peculiar selection of things. Anyway, going to carry on through, and I don't know if this is the it is this is the same uh, this is the same Patrick. Oh, okay. Now we're getting. So he goes by the name. I've actually forgot to mention. He goes by the name Ingle B Ingle by Boy in the chat if he's there. So this is an Air King from 1946. Yeah, this is an original Air King. This is what the Rolex Air King was all about. And you don't need to know much about the history. You just need to know that these watches were supplied to pilots in the RA. Well, this is great. Curtis has just joined us. How cool is this Air King? Uh, he's back in the chat saying that my 16750 worn daily for 22 years between 83 and 2005, then alternated between Seiko and G-Shock when I couldn't afford a service on the GMT for five years. Yeah, and uh, I, I hope I got it right. I think I said 20 years on, on your, your GMT earlier. Curtis was at the beginning of the show. I'll say again, if you're joining at a later stage when the show hasn't been fully rendered yet, it takes a good 24 to 48 hours for the full show to be shown off. Um, but yeah, let's get back into this. I mean, as far as Air Kings go, what a beautiful dial. Look at it. Why can't Rolex be like this nowadays? Imagine they brought out a tribute piece similar to this. It would be exceptional. I think not only the enthusiasts would love it, but I think so many others would be drawn to that styling and uh, does case back have 6b on it eric asks he didn't send me a case back shot of it at all is that a telltale sign they need to do this again i mean so we're looking at a watch that's very much 1946 we're in the oyster we're not we're not so much cushion case are we have we transitioned away from cushion case at this point <clears throat> we're now it's cushion case the better word what did they call them Bubble back, sorry. Is this a bubble back case that they would be using there? Uh, big, small seconds, Neferion. And I mean, it had a function back then. You can see that this is clearly inspired by uh, the Dirty Dozen in a way. I mean, they had similar formats to them. Imagine having a broad arrow on the dial. I bet you Rolex said not a chance are we putting broad arrows on these pieces. Uh, but everything, the pencil styled hands, the numeral arrangements. Air King supplied to RAF pilots in the late 40s, early 50s as these awesome commemorative models. And as it is, it's lost to time. Nowadays, we see the Air King, and it's at the back end of Rolex's catalog. We saw a modern one a second ago. But this is where it all started. And yeah, as far as a precision chronometer in the Rolex line, yeah, it, it definitely whispers about its presence. I think it looks gorgeous. Hitting the water again. <sighs> Foreman says, 1946 Air King. Hollow Arabics, off white. It's just it looks so good. It really does look good. I wonder what would happen if they if they rearrange the dial to have a rounded uh, numeral placement like that Omega we saw earlier on. Mm. One of my favorites of the show again from Patrick. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Next up, jumping to Pekka, who sent in and there was talk about Pelagos's earlier. Uh, a black version, full black variant of the Tudor Pelagos, and there was the question posed of which would you choose? Would you choose a Black Bay 58 or a Pelagos? It all depends on your wrist size and if you prefer a more beefier watch, obviously. But as far as a piece that represents the modern attempt the Tudor has gone with the way they've done their brand, this is the best thing in the in the, uh, the playpen. You've got snowflake dial, snowflake hands, fully loomed bezel, helium escape valve. You've got a hollow, uh, hollow end link inspired bracelet but then a gorgeous clasp. Also notice the depth to the dial when you have a closer look at it. And next to the blue variant, this one definitely is very subtle in the way it presents itself. Not so much of a fan of five lines of text. It's really unnecessary, really unnecessary. Um, what would make this watch sing? Imagine they, they, they took the Pelagos and tried to, they brought it down a little bit in size. Imagine putting the Pelagos in a 58 styled case format with a helium release valve, full titanium, a Tudor rose on the dial. 
I'm not a fan of the shield. I think the rose is gorgeous. But yeah, Neo saying it's underrated. It's awesome. It, it is. It is something that stands head and shoulders above so many other watches in its price bracket. Dealing with a full titanium watch, the only downside, I think, when it comes to someone who has pretty average wrists, it's 42 mils in size and it's tall. It's like 15, 16 mils in height. So it's not ideal for everyone to wear. But yeah, looks kind of big on the wrist. Yeah, it definitely does, as Forbin says. Great looking watch though. I mean, I, I just love the fact that it's it's using the correct styles and arrangements of the numerals and batons everywhere, the correct hands, uh, and also just simple things like the all white arrangement around the hands. We don't have uh, anything that's polished, anything that actually shines, which makes it the best, one of the best reading dive watches that you get nowadays. Because you don't want any kind of refraction and, and glare, thanks to, and I'm sure Eric Bell will probably attest to it, that when you're in the water, you don't want anything to shine in your eyes when you want to read the time. No reflections, no polished surfaces whatsoever. Mm, I could talk about this watch for a while, but I think uh, made my point. It's a nice piece. Thanks for this, Pekka. Absolute pleasure. Next, we're jumping to Raymond. And similar to the pink dial watches that we spoke about earlier, very briefly, he sends in a Longines Heritage 1945. Uh, and he, picked, he got this watch for a steal, if I remember right. He got it for a really good price. And I think a few people love this watch just because of, we spoke about the Smith's uh, Air Ministry earlier on, same ballpark, except it's actually under the license of Longines as a brand. And I think he, he said to me that he picked this up for a complete and utter bargain recently, brand new, and he got like a good thousand off whatever the retail price was. The small seconds are too small. And that's the thing. I mean, when you're talking about a piece that pays tribute to an original, I feel like this is almost to the T, exactly the same as, uh, as the original. I would imagine that this would be much bigger in the original watch. Correct me if I'm wrong. But again, they, they also have to scale the size of this up right, to fit the more modern. I would imagine this would probably be about 33 mils back in the day. Um, but there's lots of things that this watch does right. I, I enjoy, do enjoy the numeral arrangement. There's talk about flat four. Let's not forget open six. I mean, can't go wrong there. Uh, the eight, everything's just clean, crisp. You've got these gorgeous hobnails at the, at the sections here around the dial. But there's just so much open space on the dial too. Uh, I think having a good look at the full dial arrangement here, there's so much negative space. And you have to ask yourself, wouldn't this watch benefit being shrunken down ever so slightly? Um, you know, just by two millimeters or so, you know? Not enough writing on the dial, Sean. And I mean, you know, that's actually the truth. We were just talking about how cluttered the pel I know you're probably saying it jokingly, that the Pelagos is just so excessive with this and, and the Longines has nothing on it. <laughs> But this watch would probably benefit from having more text on the dial. Something simple. I mean, if it was me doing a redesign, up the scale of the subdial for sure. Probably get away from the polished element and keep the dial, you know, this gorgeous flat champagne. Then, you know, put the automatic as a curved section at the top, maybe, underneath the Longines name. Add the add the the wings of the Longines brand on top. Something to just take up that open space. Maybe shrink it down by two millimeters. But as far as owning a watch that just, you know, it's a, it's a manual wind, you get to enjoy all of that old stuff. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And the fact that he got it for a steal, and you can't go wrong with it, no? And uh, I was going to say something else. Does this watch pip the, um, the Longines Heritage Classic that I speak about all the time with the sector dial? That's the question. I don't know if it does. This feels so much more old-fashioned next to the sector dial piece. Um, but yeah. The fact that you got it for a steal, that it pays tribute to all the old models. I think it's about 39 millimeters in size. Mm, it's gorgeous. And just get some chats out to you guys. Uh, Kurt is talking about the Sky Dweller retirement watch purchased December 2019. I remember. So nice. Uh, Kurt is also saying, <clears throat> choice between JLC Master Ultra Thin Perpetual Calendar. No regrets. Oh, geez. You can't, you can't compare the two. I think the Sky Dweller is in a different category. Uh, did I say self-winding? I'm just looking at the watch itself. It says automatic here. I'm a genius, right? We've been almost running for three hours. You can imagine. Uh, Chrono Gray's uh, cool Longines heritage. Just wish the copper dial was a little bit more noticeably warmer. 
deeper and copper thing. And that was something else. The pink, the, the whole pink uh, salmon dial arrangement we were talking about. This is a bit more champagne in finish. It's difficult to tell in this lighting, but as it is. Now, this is funny. This is one of the last modern Rolexes that we're going to see in the professional. We haven't seen many professional models. We've seen lots of uh, lots of explorers, but you can't exactly call them professional. They're close, but no, no cigar in the scheme of things. But this is one of the best pictures, I think, of the show. <clears throat> this comes in from Rob. Birth of his, oops, birth of his baby daughter. First child. And he says that his daughter is going to be inheriting this watch one day. And uh, ooh, come back, Magic Mouse, you beautiful gem. Talking about Panda Daytonas, I gotta say, on a rubber strap, does look nice. And Rob's in the chat. Love my daughter. Thanks for including both her and the watch. Absolute pleasure. I mean, this this is this is one of the best shots of the show. And <clears throat> this is a good point. There was talk about bullying and stuff in the chat in the beginning. I hope I've managed to quieten a few guys who were, who were talking earlier. But there's so much more to watches at the end of the day. Watches are just things. They're just objects. So take everything that I say with a pinch of salt. This is a hobby that we love. But this, <laughs> this is what matters more than anything else in life. Family, love. Love is more important than anything else. And if you're buying watches for the sake of, of clout, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You've got to buy it because you enjoy it, because it's a hobby and a passion. But family and, you know, life. So much more important, ladies and gents. Daytona can't go wrong with it, mm. especially this arrangement. I think on the rubber strap, sublime. Russell's in the chat. Russell, do this to your Daytona. I think I think it would it would look awesome. Um, and what makes it work so well? It's it's not rocket science. You look at the way the contrasting elements work, black on black. It's it just separates. It splits up. <clears throat> it allows you to look at the watch in. There's a lot more detail to it. Should I say? You, you focus more on the white elements on the dial, not so much the black elements because they meld together a lot better. And, and altogether, what this watch does, the one gripe I have is the way the subdials are slightly higher than the, the quarters. You notice that they've been raised ever so. This is a good show. This is my one gripe. With modern Rolex's automatic movements, I really don't like the fact that it's offset there, but hey, what can I say? I guess it was done to just increase the presence of the subdials on the piece, but yeah, as far as modern pieces go, there's, there's a gent in the chat. Uh, we have a Mark P who might or might not have one of these watches at the moment. And I'm interested in knowing his thoughts about it and whether he's planning on keeping it or not. And uh, in my case, what, if, if money was no option, would I be going for a Panda Daytona? I don't think I would. Honestly, I don't think. I know they're the hottest watches to get. It's what everyone aspires to own in this space. But... Mm, it's just not my taste. It's a bit too busy. Chronographs, on the other hand, are nice, nice pieces. Do you want something that's simpler for a daily wearing watch? This is so practical, though. What am I saying? It's got everything. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's stainless steel, ceramic. Yeah, I love it. But this, as a, as a photo, composition, yeah, one of the best. Talking about love and life, undecided, Mark P says. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, it's difficult. I can imagine it's very difficult. But what does it feel like? having the creme de la creme on the wrist. I've tried on one of these in the past, back in the day when Rolex actually allowed you into their boutiques to try on these pieces when there was no, this was like 20, what, 2015, 2016. Uh, since then, it's turned into a complete nightmare. But uh, yeah, it's a pretty special piece for what it represents. Right, just don't lust for it because everyone wants it, Chaitan says. It's another thing. Just because everyone likes it doesn't mean that it's good for you. Very important. And this this saying that someone who's in love with this piece who really wants to pick one up, but basically everyone and their mother has it at this point in time. So uh, yeah, take take whatever I say with a pinch of salt because that's just how the show works. This comes in from Sam. And Sam lives like 10 miles away from me and he's actually offered this watch to me to review on the channel. I have yet to follow up on an email. It's been a busy week. I haven't caught up with him, but... <sighs> Should I pick up one of these pieces to review? Would, would it be good for me to have one of these hands-on to talk about and discuss it in a bit more detail? It's amazing. I mean, you guys in the community, can I just say, there's, there's still 200 of you watching at the moment. We've been running for almost three hours, but I put out a feeler saying, ladies and gents, if you have a 214-270 and you're willing to send it for review, I would love that, right? 
I got three separate emails from three different parts of the world, one in New York, one in Germany, and one here, yeah, literally just up the road from me saying, oh, absolutely, I'd send it to you. And it's like, who are you guys? You're dealing with a six grand watch right now, and you can just send it to me. I think it's, it's exceptional. It's, it's when you, got, you really start to see the good in the community and how spectacular it is. We're here for, for all the good parts, all the bad parts, and uh, yeah, it's a gem. Phoenix, Phoenix Sonic, no, Eric, this is def, can't be a Phoenix. This is way too grainy for a Phoenix strap. It's just your standard gray NATO, I would imagine. Um, and what I love so much about Sam, I followed him on Instagram. I don't have his handle up close, but he he says that this watch, on some days he thinks it's the best, on other days he just doesn't understand it at all. Uh, I've said that about the Royal Oak very often. <laughs> Time to fly to New York, <laughs> Russell says. Um, I've said that often about the Royal Oak as a watch that some days I think is optimal, other days don't understand it. He has the same feeling about this watch, and it's it's kind of a piece that sits in the back burner in his collection. He doesn't necessarily enjoy it very much, but I mean, it's it's cool. I do like it on NATO as well. We've had a look at a lot of, of explorers through the show. Um, but yeah, if you guys would like to sit just any watch, if you'd like to send any watch over, reach out to me on email, we can catch up. Preferably if you're in the UK. When it comes to traveling, when it comes to sending watches overseas, especially during this time, not ideal. Don't think it's a safe idea because of delays and everything in between. But yeah, Sam, it's an absolute pleasure. I would love to have this in hand. Review it next to the Seamaster and see just how modern and vintage influences have changed these two pieces over time. Uh, you agree with Sam, as Mark says, yeah. And, and Mark also has one of these, so yeah. Anyway, and I, th I don't know if this is the same Sam, someone different. I think it's a different Sam. Sends in a Grand Seiko 9F quartz. I, I assume it's a 9F quartz because of the star on the dial. He didn't give me a spec information. But another example of a Grand Seiko. And what are your opinions? Whoa, I just spiked the mic again. What are your opinions on the 9F movement? I would like to know that. Um, Curtis sounds like a great day. What's Curtis doing? He says, I may have a London trip on my last airline flight, 13th to 15th. I'll be in London all day from the 14th. Let me know. I'll train down to you. Ooh, that would be pretty exciting, Curtis. I will let you know. I will keep in touch. Uh, we're pretty good with our emails, often enough. We try to be, at least. It's so difficult. Me and, uh, and collaboration and replying to emails, the worst. Um, yeah, so this piece, I do not know so much about the reference. I just know it's a 9F movement. No. 9F courts. One of the most accurate movements out there, I think Adrian from Barkin Jack was was one who really uh, pushed the name out in our community for those those explorer inspired pieces, uh, those GMT variants. But as it is, I think when you're dealing with a brand like Seiko, I mean you know Seiko's history with the courts movement, they they pretty much and Citizen as well, right? They nearly destroyed the industry. So the fact that they're they're still doing it and still doing it better than anyone. It's pretty funny. I, I like that that reversal, that role reversal. So yeah, Sam, thanks for sending this in. I don't think I don't think it was the same Sam. Maybe it was who sent in these two watches, but yeah, you clearly like your watches on straps. Next, next to Sinan. Wouldn't you believe we have another <laughs> another explorer? As I say, I like the explorer, so they just come in fast and strong. Um, Tom Austin says that GS normally comes on a lovely beads of rice bracelet. Okay, well, yeah. I have absolutely no idea. Me and references in the Seiko line do not know. And Tao saying, don't like courts. I can agree with you. Uh, 9F movements are great. People need to read them. They really are. Bjorn are. They, they are a cut above. Talk about plus, plus minus five seconds a year accuracy. That's the star rating. That's to do with their regular. It's, it's great. I mean, talking about what they represent, one of the most accurate movements out there. Can't really get close. Um, I'm trying a Breguet Classique next week, James says. Oof, I think you're going to fall in love with it. There is something so charming about that watch. It's the, the 5177, five, no? Is that the reference? Whew, stunning. Yeah, so another, another explorer, and I think he sent a great shot of it up close that we can enjoy. I love this. So this being an explorer uh, first gen, look at the way the bezel is done here. Is it just my eyes that are playing on me, or does this bezel look like it has a more curved form factor to it? And we've just looked at the second gen. It's not my eyes of people. I really do believe, I really do believe that the second generation, the Mark II explorers, have a much rounder or should have a much flatter bezel next to this. Look how rounded it is around the edges here. Maybe it's just my eyes playing tricks on me, but there's something. And it's one element that I kind of, I kind of not appreciate with the Explorer is that it deserves 
a, a more rounded bezel. Because what it does, as you can probably see pretty well here, it, it curves the light around it. You get to appreciate the, even though it's 39 mils in size, it wouldn't wear necessarily like 39 because of the light play and the, the refraction bezel patina. <laughs> yeah, I uh, gotta say, I love, love the style. We get to, and, and I think Russell said in the chat, uh, great photo, it is. And seeing the raised white gold, interesting how people find this to be such a peculiar aspect to these watches. On one hand, you can agree that it affects legibility and readability because uh, in certain lights, these completely disappear. But then you've got full white gold numerals on the dial. I find it very strange, actually, because you look at all the other generations, you know, the, the 114270 and the generation before, they did have some kind of filler or cutout on the numerals themselves. They weren't loomed. But these are, it's, it's almost like Rolex at this point was trying to uh, give it like almost like a hallmark, this being the hallmark explorer from the line. Why not just go extra with white gold on the dial? Yeah. It's nice, really awesome photo again, Shuran. Thank you for sending this in. And yeah, I've got to carry on through. Tom Austin talking about 9F. Then we jump to Steph, I think this is Stefan. I think it's Stefan. I might've gotten your name wrong there in the chat, uh, in the description. This is called an Orion Calamity, another micro brand. One thing you look at here, which I think is great, is the, the Devil Diver layout. And similar to brands like Notice we've looked at earlier, I don't know if this is a Swiss movement, it might be an ETA, but uh, everything, the blue highlights, the, the orange accents in places, ooh, I'd really like this. Orange highlight at the top of the bezel, ceramic bezel insert, uh, this billet steel crown that we know, and everything. The quarters are jagged, we've spoken about this often already on the show. Um, Forbin classes, are those Explorer Arabics too silver, too polished? Good point, let's go and have a look at that. That's a very good point to highlight. If this didn't have, imagine what this watch would look like if it didn't have polished white gold elements to it, uh, especially on these numerals. If they were just a flat brushed finish, this watch would be so legible. I think it would be much more sought after actually, because what this does with this highly ref, you know, reflective quality, it compromises what makes the Explorer so good in certain lights is that you can't read it that easily. You can't make out the Arabics. And that's that's the joy. I find it funny how Rolex all of a sudden just switched over to the fully loomed layout. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah, I've spoken about these so much, but I do agree. I think, very good point, Forbin. Uh, they are a bit too polished for what they should be. If they were a flat brushed finish, they would have a different, a different appeal. Um, yeah, so there was talk about Devil Diver and uh, Calamity, a diver called Calamity, and Eric Bell is, is <laughs> it's not good, right? I mean, you definitely do not, you don't want that on your dive watch, because it's, you know, supposed to be something that is your instrument, something that, that gives you this idea of dread, <laughs> or end of, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna die diving with this thing, <laughs> it's not the best, not the best marketing ploy. Yeah, talk about a micro brand, I do like the bezel. I must say the bezel does have a nice arrangement there. Uh, it's pretty simple and it doesn't reflect the light. It's actually flat, which is something important. I find, I'm sure uh, Eric could probably also agree, so many of these ceramic bezels that have these high glass finishes to them, they become so difficult to read underwater when you're trying to determine what you're doing. Serenity, maybe, it's better. That's like the complete antithesis, right? <laughs> or an antonym of calamity. Yeah, I like it. Orion. Calamity. And next, I think this is also from Stefan. He sends in a Breitling Chronomat. And this piece, I, I, this is, what can we say about this watch? I think of, I think of 1990s through and through. And what I like about it is it seems like Breitling has a kept, it's kept a lot of these features where they're more modern pieces. I mean, referring to the Chronomat, I think there's another one in the show. No, this is it. This is the last one. So, the chronomat that we now know with the, the 369 layout of the digital the any digi layout this bezel to me i just find it's so true to what breitling does but it's so peculiar and what could we say it represents i i look at it and think of ulysses nardon right i'm sure russell could agree How do, i always get the name wrong ulysses nardon i think this looks like the kind of layout that they would appreciate very much like a 90s variant and Russell saying shiny and that's what Breitling does hey they just polish every surface he didn't give me details about the watch itself but uh I think 
it's a piece that does represent its time period pretty well, being the early 2000s, late 90s-ish. <laughs> Russell says, no, it doesn't represent UN. That's funny. Uh, yeah, but as far as, I mean, I, I don't understand the aesthetic behind the bezel. I've been thinking about it a lot, actually. It has this nautical styling around it. Reminds you of, you know, the uh, the, the large wheel that you'd be turning behind a ship. Uh, what's what's the term? Some sailor out there could probably tell me. Reminds you of that that old you know, baroque styling almost. It's very classical. Uh, and then talking about the numerals on the dial, it's nice to see. And you could probably read the dial very easily. This could have been his first watch, I think. He might have said in the description. <laughs> the watch for what occasion? <laughs> Talk about a daily wearing watch. This definitely stands out a bit too much for a daily wearer. So you're dealing here with a chronograph with a, you could use the bezel for, for dive timing, I guess. I don't know if it's waterproof fully. I don't, it does have screw down crowns, I think. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a bizarre model, but it's nice to see where Breitling has transitioned to and from. They're having quite a strange time in the industry, right? They've, they've really cut back on packaging. They've cut back on materials. They have a deal with Tudor with, with making their, um, uh, their movement complications. I think they supply Tudor with their chronographs and Tudor supplies them with their base movements, something like that. But this was the, the early days of Breitling. I'm, I'm sure this was just a, an ETA or a Lamania or something. I do not know. So Forbin saying, I don't mean to offend anyone, but shiny with gold trim reminds me of 1980s fossil watches. And I mean, that's something that could come to mind when you look at a piece like this. Uh, what I do appreciate is that they've managed to stick to their guns with a lot of these aesthetics that you see. The way that these, as far as I know, the only brand that does focus on bracelets with flat end links that, that mesh into the lugs is Breitling. And you see that with this, with the Navi timers, lots of other models. Yeah, but it's very flashy for what it is. I mean, yeah, had a good time. Thank you for sending these in, Stefan. Always a pleasure. And next, another piece. Now we're jumping to another Omega. We've had a lot of Omegas. And uh, yeah, you can see the format of the show very much like the, the daily wearing theme. Again, we're following all the way through with it. Um, Seamaster GMT. Now, this is based on the 2254 variant. I don't know exactly what the number, probably like a 2257 or something else. And there's, you know, we're talking so much about the, the Polar Explorer 2. I think we're going to see one in a second, actually. This is basically Omega's attempt at looking at it. How could they improve the design of this watch? Simple. Extra emphasis of line weights around all of the plots. Make them at least twice as thick, three times as thick as the minute track. That would just make it sing and stand out. They did it with the hour and minute hand. Why don't they do it with the numerals of the plots? And then the bezel. I think the, the typeface on the bezel inserts needs to be smaller. Needs to be, I mean, they could have even gone to the lengths of actually engraving engraving the numerals into the bezel so that it's under the radar 1655 buck buck says yeah i mean it has the same kind of aesthetic and gotta love the sword hands this arrangement purely mod inspired you know uh, it's just such a classic from that timeline and it's sad that they've deviated away from this they could make such a killing if they had to bring this watch back or approach approach it a little bit differently with a different layout yeah Omega Blizzard is off the charts. Is that what they call it? That's a nice nickname. But the bezel, the insert to me, it just looks too much. It's just too excessive for what it is. Uh, and they've, they've done some great work with others over time. But similar to the 2254, that's the one area I would possibly look into replacing. Um, anyway, going to carry on through. And I think he sent in another shot here of the GMT with a Seiko King Quartz. Now we get to see just how these two watches sit side by side. I don't know the age of this watch, but I would imagine it's like the 1970s-ish. You can tell by the case and everything. Maybe it's 1980s era. So clean on the left side of the case. Good point. I mean, I didn't even realize there's no uh, horn on the side. It's fantastic. Uh, but then I have a look at the bezel again. You notice when I say, it's, it's hard to say that it looks cartoonish, but that's what it feels like at least to me. Um, and... I guess to the detriment that the dial being so faint with it. I mean, if, if it was me, if I actually owned this watch, I would take this to a very reputable watchmaker and say, take a paintbrush and just thicken up all the lines around the indices. I know it's probably, it's bad to say, it's uh, 
blasphemous, <laughs> but that would be my first approach to just improve the overall layout. You want those you want those plots to line up with the thickness of the hands. It would look so, so good. Um, nice, great looking watch, red highlights and accents, gotta like it. And seeing them side by side, unique, different. That bezel though, just needs to be tightened up. Okay, next up, all hail King Seiko, Eric says, it's great. Seiko DeLorean case. I should also say that I enjoy this, this beads of rice styled bracelet. Uh, must be very comfortable. And talking about comfort and bracelets in the industry, there are a few that do better than brands like AP. I don't think we have another Royal Oak on the show, but anyway, moving up next to Tillman or Tao, who's in the chat. So this man has been jumping back and forth with, oh no, come back. No, you're not supposed to see that yet, damn it. He's been jumping back and forth with colors, with what's, what style of watch does he want for his collection. I don't think he's owned a Rolex up until this point, but oof, he's just picked this up recently. And I was thinking he was going to be getting a five digit Explorer, not a, not a six digit. Uh, and he has completed his collection, he believes. Too many Rolex. Was that a longer? Wait and see, wait and see. So we know Tillman very well. There he is in the chat. We know him very well because of his Lunga that he owns. The Lunga one from 1995. We're going to have a look at it in a second. And this is going to be another little mini collection review. But we've chatted about uh, Rolex through three emails uh, on and off. And we were talking about Explorers. I was thinking he was going to just get a standard white dial polar. But picking up this piece, the modern take. Let's have a look at the collection now. This is where it stands. And when it comes to, he says he feels complete with what he has at the moment. And the diversity is something to really appreciate and admire. I've said to him, block out the two watches on the right-hand side and you have an absolutely phenomenal two watch collection. A large 42 mil Explorer for the rugged work, longer one. And this is not just any longer one, it's the longer one from 1995, solid case back. We've looked at it like four or five times on the show in the past. What is not to like about an original longer one? So talking about great collection and everything, I mean, the Globemaster, spoken about it to death before because I just believe it to be this great amalgamation of pieces. He loves he loves wearing this in the office. It's one of his casual wearers. He wears this on a NATO, actually, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then he has a Nomos, what is it, a Nomos Tangenta or a Nomos Ahoy? I can never get it right. This was a gift from his mother, so he would never sell this watch. I did ask him about it. But this is the kind of piece that he wears when he wants to be inconspicuous going around with no one noticing. Again, he's based in Germany, so that's another great telltale sign that it's optimal for someone like him. And he has all his bases covered. He's got German, he's got Swiss, Rolex Omega, Lunga, Nomos. And also like the fact that he has two blue dials, two white dials, no black dial arrangement. Uh, talking about casual wear and tear, this piece for very special occasions, Globemaster you could use anywhere, mainly for formal occasions around the house or you know, at work. Uh, Nomos you wear in the sea, I think you've actually swum with us a lot. And the Explorer too, I mean, for anything else, full stainless steel bracelets, I love it, man. It's such a nice story. And it just goes to show when it comes to looking at collections, they don't need to be the, the standards that we see all the time. I always appreciate when we have a look at a collection that is just slightly off the beaten track to what you conventionally see. And uh, just for those who might be interested in knowing, this being the original from 95, it's virtually doubled in value since it was bought back then. Uh, being the original, it was the first batch ever made. They only made like 500, maybe Tao can mention in the chat. Yeah, love it. So as far as the collection goes, all the bases covered. You don't need to spend any more money. You have a superb set. And I really do like the fact that you went Big, modern, professional Rolex. Please share some wrist shots of that for the next show. That would be awesome, Tao. And uh, Polo and Amiga is great. Others, not so. Is that so what you think? I mean, that's that's the deal. I, when it comes to looking at brands, for me and for my tastes, looking at the selection of watches on display, the one that speaks to me the most is the Globemaster, personally. It would be the one I would wear, just because it's it's so basic. That's, that's my taste. But when you're dealing with asymmetry, this is, I mean... Longer one, what else needs to be said? I just blew into the mic, sorry. <laughs> uh, and then you've got the, the Explorer dial layout. Yeah, we could just talk about this for ages. I don't want to drag on too long. Show's already been in three hours. Um, so between 350 and 500 pieces, Longer won't tell the exact numbers. Thank you for that, Tal. Tried the Longer one, Harrods, the moon phase at Harrods, Graham says, loved it. 
the size is I've, I've only ever worn a datagraph and a platinum datagraph, 39 millimeters, mm, beautiful size. Carrying on. Thank you for this, Tillman. Next, we're jumping to our man, Tom Austin, based in Japan. Is he? No, he's based in Hong Kong. Based in Hong Kong. <laughs> and he, at the bequest of me and many others in the community, we said, pick up the Glasuto Riganal 1957, 1968. What do they call it? The CQ. Just call it the CQ. And it's just like my Seamaster, I think, side by side. The 57 Seamaster and the CQ, especially this one, the reissue, they both speak the same language. Have a look at it. I, I so enjoy it. It's a watch that I look at and I get so much enjoyment out of seeing just the little things. Look at how they do the script on the dial. Glashütte, German. They know what they're doing here. And Tao and ta saying thanks for the showcase. Oh, it's a pleasure. Such, such a pleasure. I love it. Great collection. So unique and different. Another underrated winner. I have a strong feeling that this is going to be a watch that people are going to be jumping on soon. And one small element that people don't highlight, some have said that the bracelet is quite cheap in the way it presents itself with the brushing. This is a win because you're dealing here with a bracelet that is solid end link, but it's fully articulate. And the articulation point is right here in the center. So it means that you have the lug to lug length is optimal. For smaller wrists, it fits perfectly. And I'll say this is better than the Seamaster that I have, the better arrangement by far. It's just so much more subtle and casual. Yeah. And then just talking about it being a diver, ceramic bezel, those large open open sixes and the, the faux patina. Again, it's, it might not be for everyone because it's uh, it's a certain watch for a certain somebody. And there's mention about Alanga and Glasuta Rignal send each other Christmas cards. You don't think they do. <laughs> I think they compete pretty hard. I mean, when we look at the uh, Glasuta's variant of the longer one, I always get the name wrong. But uh, yeah, the pan the panoramic, the panoluminor date, I never get it right. The panoluma, uh, whatever. Nice looking piece though, 38 and a half millimeters in size. Tom Austin, they're saying macro adjust, the clasp is great as well and discreet. Exactly the same as the Omega. I think they'd stand head to sh no, shoulder to shoulder in many ways. I'd actually love to have this watch next to mine, having a look at just, I mean, this is mine. Mine is a 50s inspired, yours is 60s, made for the, the specialist CQ German branch military forces. And the, the arrangement on the dial, something else to note is that this style arrangement is very much a 50s element, 50s and 60s, where you see the baton, the two, four, baton, six. It's not. It's not the the most modern arrangement that we know today, but uh, yeah, man. I mean, talk about the large arrow on the minute hand. You can't go wrong. Looks awesome. So different. And it's what you can wear out in public. No one would be the wiser. No one knows what it is. That's what makes it even more special. Um, so, so Richard's saying, where do I send pictures? In the uh, des description of this video, you'll see everything there. My email's there. Uh, I've linked an Instagram handle to uh, Dear Artifact for the cover photo from the beginning of the show. Have a look. Thank you for this, Tom. Next, we are jumping to Varent. I think he was in the chat. Varent, sorry. And it's a 556 Pearl Dial Zen Automatic. And this, I mean, this arrangement here, seeing the lighting, mm, it looks like it's cosmic almost. And we were talking about Zen earlier and how diverse they, they approach their watches. There's been lots of talk. I think I've seen Tim Mosso doing reviews of the um, Damascus steel, the Damascus Zena variant, where it's a full Damascus steel case, Damascus dial. Zen just goes to the extra lengths, extra efforts with what they do. Just looking again at the EZM line and the, the, the U lines, they incorporate capsules to, to highlight how much oxygen has entered the case over time. And uh, yeah. I think Zinn is a brand that everyone should look into a bit more seriously because there's just too much variety to follow. Reed says, what a photo. Can you imagine what this must look like outside? I don't know how legible it would be, but yeah, looks great. Personally, I would, I would rather get the Damascus variant of this watch, though. I think Damascus steel is something that oof, it just has another level to it. Um, Love the dial. You wonder why more you don't see more mother of pearl dials. Speaking of which, Russell, you sent me that Patek of your wife's today, and uh, <laughs> it's a mother of pearl. So I can imagine it's why you love it. Uh, yeah, coming out of Africa, mother of pearl is everywhere. Anyway, Varant, thank you for sending this in. I hope you're still here. Maybe not. 
but going to carry on through. We've got a few more pieces. We've been running for over three hours at this point. Holy smokes. Another 15 minutes or so to go through the last pieces to end off. Vince sends in a Stover. Can you believe just looking at German watches all of a sudden from Glasuto to this is not planned. Eh? This is all alphabetical. Uh, we went from, from Lange to what else? Glasuto to Sun. Now we're at Stover. I think it's great. And then we're switching to purely Swiss in a second. Uh, Foreman saying, I'm dismayed. The dial numerals go from eight to 10 and skip nine. It's like leaving out the main compass point. Are we talking about the uh, the CQ? Ah, uh, yeah, that is that is something. I mean, you want those quarters, right? As one element, good point. Very good point. It's just the style of that, that dial arrangement. It's definitely not for everyone. I should also mention, it's nice seeing how big it looks. You can, if you're going blind, you could see it and read it so easily uh, for what it is. So Stover Classic, I think this is a 40 mil, yeah, 40 mil Flieger, a uh, white dial, which is not something that we see very often. But overall, you've got, uh, I don't know how legible this would be actually. It looks like everything glows in the dark. So all the batons, all the numerals, large onion crown, uses a an ETA movement, I think, that's been uh, modified in a few places by the brand. Uh, I'm tired. He's got to be tired, Junior says. He's talking about me. Yeah, I mean, as it is, three hours. I'm doing pretty well, considering there's still whiskey and coffee in my glass. Anyway, Vince, thanks for sending this in. We're going to jump now to some heavy hitters. First, let's have a look at Zane's piece. Should should we? Can we look at Zane first or Russell first? Hmm. I want to look at Zane's first. Uh, this is a pretty special one. Pretty, pretty special one. And it is, I don't know if he's still in the chat, it's a Patek reference 6102 celestial complication. And what makes it sing to me the most, I think, is the way the strap is arranged. There is something very special. It's almost like an elephant gray strap. Whiskey River, don't run dry. <laughs> uh, so this complication, I'm not someone who understands the celestial very much. Maybe a junior in the chat could, could highlight. <clears throat> and that's a great comment. <laughs> uh, Riff Russell, if you could highlight this this piece in a bit more detail, how it, if I'm not wrong, the dial fully rotates along with the hands over the course of the day. In something you're leaving us, great to have you here, and for everyone else joining, geez, there's still 200 of you watching. It's been a good show. We've had a good good look at <clears throat> variety, and my voice is about to go. Hold on a second, <laughs> right at that three hour mark, so the voice goes, hitting the water. I tell you, sometimes I think my balls haven't dropped yet, so. It's another level. It is for sure. It's one. I think it's in platinum. It's a real heavy hitter. <clears throat> so the dial fully rotates along with the uh, with the handset over the course of the day. You've got a moon phase complication here, and it's just so in line with astro navigation that we talk about a lot. Astronomy. If you want to look at the history of longitude and that development, I can put that in the corner of the screen for you to look up. And uh, coming up next, ball watches feature, <laughs> dropping a ball. Um, not an expert in the piece, I'm afraid. Zane, better than a Paul Newman. Yeah, well, talk about, it's not a hype watch, which I really like, actually. The fact that it's a piece that only an enthusiast would enjoy, really, that's something special. I mean, next to this, the 5370 is a hype watch. The Nautilus is the Aquanauts. This is something a little bit more unique. And I'm surprised that Russell doesn't know this this brand very much, this this style of watch, should I say. Uh, Mark, thank you for joining us all. Absolute pleasure having you here. You've been here practically all night. Enjoy your weekend away, brother. It's a great looking piece, though. And, and the dial arrangement, there's so many little details to it. Also, enjoy the fact that this piece has been worn. Not you know, It's got some scuffs on it. It's been used. That's something special, too. So yeah, talk about it not being a hype watch. I think that's pretty unique. And Matthew, we're not done yet. Not done yet. Something pretty nice is coming. Uh, thank you for sending this in, Zane. It is a really, as, as mentioned by Tao saying, it's a cool Patek, really unique piece. And this is when you start looking at the collector side of, of Pateks, when it's a watch that's so obscure that no one would ever really recognize. Hatsi, thank you for joining us all. I think you're on your way out as well. Um, this is just so unique and different because it's a one-of-a-kind complication that is never spoken about in the broader area. I'm pretty sure there have been essays and theses and theses written about these. But uh, yeah, as far as everything goes, the color highlights, the, the, the red accents, gorgeous. Now we're going to jump to uh, Russell's selection of pieces. And we kept it very simple, very, very simple. We'll start with 
He sent this in about a week ago. We're going to be looking at a series of Nautiluses, Nautili. This being a 5711 anniversary edition, this might be my phone. I didn't save it very well, but this is the, uh, I think it's the 40th anniversary. And bear in mind, ladies and gents, that this dial, all the, ba all the baguettes are diamonds. We don't have a uh, loom plot at all. And the way Patek, we've said this often, that Patek knows how to handle their dials and their, their diamonds so, so well. This is a clear example. What made this piece stand out, apart from the, the anniversary script on the dial, which is hit or miss, depending on what you like, uh, the blue is very different. It's a royal blue. Next to the more petrol blue that we expect to see on the Nautilus, uh, this is a much deeper shade. And I think this is, I won't mention the beach, but I have a feeling I know what the beach is here, Russell. Um, diamond baguettes look so good and so subtle. And I find it's, it's, it's incredible. You see this watch up close, you wouldn't believe that they're actually diamond set. Um, but we are going to have a look at a few more as we go through. I, liked, I like this idea of seeing two of them. And um, one of my favorites, I think the creme de la creme in the line, this is what I thought would be a nice way to end the show, is the full perpetual 5740G. And what do they do so well here? Symmetry. Symmetry is there, bang on. It's easy to read. I have actually challenged Russell to wear this for a month straight. And it'd be interesting to know what he thinks overall. It'd be nice to, to hear his background and the story. There's a few little details that he, he did mention. Uh, we were chatting earlier today. One, one element that makes this watch sing over the standards is that it has a modified clasp with that little tang that normally you know used to latch over the top that's not there anymore it's a much more modern updated clasp feature uh more watches requiring me to put on my my readers <laughs> buck says <laughs> yeah i agree it's not the easiest thing to read but you know uh, i really do enjoy this why patek didn't go this far in the beginning i mean ap does it all the big brands do these these two halves to join them up with no need for that extra security gadget but yeah, 5740, white gold. That is a G. Yeah, it is. Um, it's something pretty unique. I don't, the dial itself, does it also have the same kind of royal blue or is it a bit more flat? But I just like how they've, the balance, the, the idea of this traditional inspired motif, they've done it with a few of their pieces in the past, but nothing so crisp and clear as this. The ultimate Nautilus could be same. I don't know. Centrelinks alone are stunning. It's unique. It is very unique. Uh, as far as discussing the, the intricacies of this watch, could definitely do that for another hour. Um, Michigan saying, Every, anyone ever have a Seamaster 2254 service with Amiga? How much? Great question. Ask, ask around. Michigan has been uh, posing that question. Exactly the same blue. So it's the same kind of radial royal blue that we see on this variant. Mm. Something pretty special. This is a keeper in a collection. And he also showed me this. This is his wife's Christmas present that you got, I think, end of last year, uh, 7, 7118. And we were discussing how clasps work. And funnily enough, I was actually saying that Patek is kind of stingy with their, I feel like this is a tobacco brown dial, nicely set bezel as well. It feels like Patek is quite stingy with the, the technology that they use because this watch actually has an adjustable bracelet. You can, you can micro adjust it in a few places to fit the wrist. Bear in mind that this is supposedly marketed to be a lady's watch but you'd think then that the man's watch would have a similar uh, layout and assortment for everyday wear and tear because that's the one gripe that you have with these pieces is that it's one size fits all and you can't you can't adjust it on the fly so as far as sports watches go it's such a peculiar beast i mean it's we were chatting about cars russell and i, I think we're going to probably do that in a lot more in future but it does sit in its own realm when we think about design history and development and all that story. What a Christmas present. Yeah, she must have been very well behaved, <laughs> Tal says. Yeah, it is. It's pretty special. I've, I actually really like the idea of the, uh, the raised 12 at the top. Would you say this is a unisex model or do they, do they market it solely towards the, the ladies in the audience? I mean, all these little details like the, the batons, they look pretty good. Organic, unique. Don't know so much about the bezel insert for men, but uh, I do like, and the size is probably like 38 mils or 37 mils. But yeah, that's uh, that's been the show, ladies and gents. Talking about daily wearing watches, this, this could most definitely 
end as a daily wearing watch uh, with all the diamonds, question mark. You never know. Everyone has their own taste, right? Um, this is probably one of, when you talk about a daily wearer, perpetual calendar is pretty much the epitome of a daily wearing watch because you get everything. Um, I would very much like to know how this watch wears over the course of a month. If Russell could just do it. Uh, XR6 with fur on the dash, power amps under the front seat. And there's a mention from Joe saying that the 2254 service is about 585. Astro Fanatics, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been a good show. It's been, you know, back to back to basics, ground roots, treating it simply. I'm so glad that we went back to you know, what made these shows good. I hope the audio has been acceptable. I tell you, it's so difficult to calibrate this mic. Currently, it's sitting at 9% input volume. That's how punchy this microphone is. So I'm still learning the, the quirks and the details. I was saying get an Explorer 1 already. <laughs> uh, I wish. I so wish. I've got to get a house first somehow. Um, for all of you who've joined in and been a part of the show, it's an absolute pleasure. We've just almost hit the three and a half hour mark. And yeah, an enjoyable afternoon. Surprisingly, the room is actually cool now all of a sudden. I think the temperature has dropped in the UK. It's a great surprise. But all of you who have contributed, I can't thank you enough for sending these watches in. I mean, uh, again, I'll pull up Dear Artifacts picture for the cover. All of you who send these pieces and you make the shows what they are. I cannot thank you all enough for taking the time out of your day to send me these separate emails for anyone who's still watching. It makes, it makes the experience so much more enjoyable for all of us. And I hope you feel the same way. Also need to say thank you to Eric. This is another highlight here. Eric Bell sent me this from Loch Lomond this week, and it's beautiful. It's a stunning whiskey. First time I've had a single malt since November last year, by the way, Eric. I'll tell you that. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute joy and a pleasure. This is what I've been wearing today, for those of you who've just joined in. Um, Seamaster 57, it's my one and only. I love it. It's still so, I still find so much enjoyment. It's so practical as an everyday wearer. And the theme of daily wearing watches. We've gone everywhere from Black Bear 58s to a full-on Nautilus perpetual calendar. And I mean, you can't get much better than that in a lineup of selections, right? Uh, yeah, you guys, you guys make these shows so much more fun and important. And I hope those who are new to the channel, new to the watch space, finds some benefit out of these talks because we get to see just so much variety in one sitting. So come next week, we're looking at watches in film how watches are perfectly cast in film. And that should be a nice take on things. But until that time, three and a half hours, I thought I would be passed out dead by the two hour mark because it was so hot in here. It feels like the temperature has dropped since then. For all of you who've been a part of the show in the chats and just contributing, oh, can't thank you enough. This is what makes this such an enjoyable weekend for me. I love these Saturdays because it just allows me to not think so much and just talk about whatever the subject matter is. But yeah, variety is the spice of horology, as Russell says. Yeah, absolutely. So have a superb Sunday. For those of you in the UK, I have a feeling that it's going to be another scorcher tomorrow. That's what they seem to tell us uh, in Europe as well, <laughs> getting a serious heat wave. Uh, everyone else in the world, I hope you're looking after yourselves, looking after your families, keeping safe, and keep enjoying this, ho this hobby for what it is. It's a hobby, and it should be taken lightly. Hold, I mean, I've always been told, hold lightly to the things of this earth. And I think, especially with what's going on in the world and, and you know, Beirut and everything that's been happening there, you've got to weigh all those perspectives and say to yourself, these are amazing things that we get to enjoy, great distractions, and that's what they should be. As a community, we can learn so much more about these things and, yeah, develop the hobby as it is every day. Mike? Miles, sorry, I call you Mike and and uh, Hoplite and everyone else. Thank you for the for the super chat, and for everyone else here, have a superb end to your weekend. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday, your Sunday, wherever you are in the world, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers for now. <laughs>